Chapter 13, The Changing Desert and a Corrected Map Monday, March 26th, at El Harash Well of the Ziegen Group. Highest temperature 27 degrees, lowest 6 degrees, fine and clear with northeast wind, which develops into a bad sandstorm at 11. The storm continues until 6.30 in the evening, and the wind does not go down until two hours later. Our halt at Ziegen should have been only for a night, but the severe sandstorm kept us windbound for another day. Ziegen is merely a group of four wells, the two that we passed on Sunday, El Harash, where we are camped, and another, Buzerig, 20 kilometers to the east. During the day, Buhalega talked to Abdullahi about my coming to the desert. You have audacity, you Egyptians, he said, for your bay to come twice to our country, which no stranger has visited before in my time. That is boldness. Why does he come here and leave all God's bounty back there in Egypt, if not for some secret purpose? He comes to our unknown country to measure and map it, and by God not once, but twice. Even my good friend Buhalega was suspicious of my intentions in penetrating into his country. I finally discovered the real basis of the antagonism of those who live in the desert to the coming of persons from the outside world. It is not religious fanaticism. It is merely the instinct of self-preservation. If a single stranger penetrated to Kufra, the cherished center of the life of their tribe, it would be, as the Bedouin says, the camel's nose inside the flap of the tent. After him would come others, and the final outcome would be foreign domination. That would mean the loss of their independence and the paying of taxes. They can hardly be blamed for dreading either of these results. The changes produced by time in the desert, which we are accustomed to think of as eternally the same, are interesting. When Rolfs passed to the westward of Ziegen on his way to Kufra in 1879, he reported a broad stretch of green vegetation here. Today there is no extent of greenness, merely a great deal of hatab, dead brushwood. Rolf's statement, however, is confirmed by Buhalega, who says that when he was a child, his father used to take him to Kufra when he went to get dates, because the Bedouins believe that the waters of the Shakara, the headquarters of the Zawayas near Jallo, are bad for children in the summer. Buhalega used to be carried on his father's back most of the way. It was in those days that the trip was made in three days and five nights without halts. They gave the camels but one meal between Jallo and Ziegen, and when they reached the latter place, the beasts were fed on the green stuff that was growing there then. What has seemed like an error on Rolf's part in describing so much vegetation at Ziegen is thus demonstrated to be merely the result of a difference in conditions after 45 years. It is probably a variation in the water conditions in the soil which has turned the living shrubs into firewood. Our trek from Budafal to Ziegen illustrated the uncertainties of desert travel. In spite of all the precautions that we could possibly think of, our fuel ran out, one camel died, and two others were so exhausted that they were to fail us soon. The food for the camels was used up also, and from Ziegen to Kufra they were fed on date tree leaves gathered at the former place, which was very poor food for them indeed. I picked up from a Bedouin a proverb with a cynical slant to it. Your friend is like your female camel. One day she gives you milk, and the next she fails you. On the two evenings at Ziegen, I took observations of Polaris with the theodolite. When the observations were worked out, I found that Ziegen was about a hundred kilometers further to the east-northeast than Rolfs had placed it. He did not visit the place, and therefore could make no observations on the spot, but relied on what he was told by the Bedouins. I found also that Ziegen is 310 meters above sea level. Tuesday, March 27th. Start at 8.15 a.m., halt at 8 p.m., make 47 kilometers. Highest temperature 26 degrees, lowest 8 degrees. Fine and clear, cold, strong northeast wind all day and all night. A few white clouds. 
From El Harash well, the guide points out the direction of Kufra as being five degrees south of southeast. For two hours we walk among Hatab, which extends about ten kilometers southeast of the well. Then we enter a region of soft sand, a little undulating. The undulations gradually increase until we get into the sand dune country late in the afternoon. At 2.30 we sighted a range of sand dunes to the east with a few black stone garas or small hills in between them. They were about 20 or 30 kilometers away and marched off to the southeast as far as we could see. Later there were girds, sand dunes, to the southwest as well and at 5.30 the girds closed in across our track, and we definitely entered them. So far, however, they were not high nor difficult to cross. The complete separation between the Bedouins and the Tibus on the march impressed me again. The blacks say that they do not like the Zawayas and fear them. The Tibu camels were well kept and better behaved than those of the Bedouins. Each Tibu camel had a lead rope, and did not run loose as the others did. In the afternoon we passed the landmark of Jebel el Fadil. As with most desert landmarks, its name commemorates someone who lost his life there. El Fadil was one of the best guides in the desert. He was going toward Kufra from Jallo with a caravan. Sandstorms of great severity swept down upon them. While there is no direct evidence of what happened, the testimony of what was finally found told the story eloquently. Fadil's eyes must have been badly affected by the driving sand. He bandaged them, and thus deprived of sight, had those who were with him describe the landmarks as they reached them. Nevertheless, they missed the wells of Zegan and tried to struggle on direct to Kufra. The desert took them in its relentless grip, and of the entire caravan but one camel survived. The beast struggled on to its home at Kufra, led by its infallible instinct. There it was recognized by the markings on its neck as belonging to El Fadil. A rescue party followed the camel's track back into the desert, but its help came too late. The bodies of the men lay stiff upon the sand, near the landmark now known by El Fadil's name. The bandage on the old guide's eyes revealed the tragic truth. Wednesday, March 28th. There were heavy clouds all day with little sunshine. It was cloudy, too, in the evening. A cold northeast wind developed at 8 a.m. into a sandstorm lasting for three hours and a half. The cold wind continued on into the evening. A few drops of rain fell at 10.30 p.m. We walked among sand dunes for two hours when we entered undulating country covered with broken black stone. It was bad going for the camels. An hour later, the black stone belt ended, and we came into the sand dunes again. At 11.30 in the forenoon, the chains of the Hawaiish hills were on our left, and sand dunes and black stone garas on our right. At 12.15, we passed on our left, four kilometers away, Gur al Maksan landmark, hills of black stone ranging from 50 to 150 meters in height. At 1.45, we passed the landmark of El Gara Wobentaha, which means the Gara and its daughter, two sugarloaf hills of appropriate proportions to suit the designation. I talked with some of the Bedouins about our losing our way in 1921. They showed no surprise. To these desert dwellers, it is all a part of the day's work, losing one's way, one's camels, one's water, or one's fuel. Thursday, March 29th. The lowest temperature this day was not recorded, as the minimum thermometer was broken in the storm. The Hawaiish hills were on our left until mid-afternoon. At 11.30, we entered soft and very undulating sand dunes, difficult going for men and camels. At 1.30, we passed Gerard el Sharif to the right, the biggest landmark we had yet seen. It was a ridge-shaped gara, 150 meters long and about 100 meters high, with three smaller ones beside it, two to the south and one to the north. At three we got into heavy dunes again, and two hours later passed into flat country with harder sand and patches of black stone. 
At 3.30 in the morning, the worst sandstorm we had encountered began. It swept the tents from the moorings, and mine collapsed on top of me, smashing a few of my instruments and also the small chronometer. With a whole tent on top of me, weighted down with a constantly growing load of sand, I was threatened with suffocation. But, fortunately, I got hold of a tent peg with which I held the canvas away from my face. Some of the men tried to come to my assistance, but I shouted to them to put the sacks of flour and pieces of luggage on their tents and mine to keep them down. I lay in my uncomfortable position under the tent for two hours or so. The sand came hurtling through the gap in the tent like shot from a gun. The men and the camels suffered badly. Had the pole of my tent fallen a fraction of an inch to one side, it would have smashed my big chronometer, and then what a difference it would have made to the scientific results of the expedition. To the outside world, the work of an explorer is either failure or success with a distinct line between them. To the explorer himself, that line is very hazy. He may have won his way through, amassed all the information that he sought, be within a score of miles of his journey's end, then suddenly his camels give out. He must abandon the best part of his luggage. Water and food take precedence. The boxes containing his scientific instruments and his records have to be left behind. Maybe his plight is still worse and he must sacrifice everything, even his own life. To the outside world, he would be a failure. Generous critics might even call him a glorious failure, but in any case, he has failed. Yet how much is that failure akin to success? Sometimes on those long treks, the man who fails has done more, has endured more hardships than the man who succeeds. An explorer's sympathy is rather with a man who has struggled and failed than with a man who succeeds, for only the explorer knows how the man who failed fought to preserve the fruits of his work. The Bedouins understood this. There is a trait in their character that surprised, even astounded me sometimes, until I grew to understand it. There was often no hilarity, no rejoicing when the day's march came to its appointed end. Today we have arrived, but tomorrow, they seem to say. Because you have succeeded today, it is nothing to brag about. It was not by your skill. It was destiny. Tomorrow you may start an easier journey and fail horribly. On my first long trip into the Libyan desert in 1921, between the oasis of Busima, one of the Kufra group, and Kufra, a three days journey, we came across the remnants of a perished caravan. There was a hand still sticking out of the sands, the skin yellow like parchment. As we passed, one of the men went reverently and hid it with sand. A three days trip, and yet those men had lost their way and died of thirst. There are many gruesome tales of the remnants of a caravan perishing within sight of the well. So far from being deterred from taking the same route, the Bedouin only says that it was God's decree that they should die on the road. Better the entrails of a bird than the darkness of the tomb, one Bedouin told me, meaning that he preferred to be eaten by vultures. It was a very tiring day, what with the disturbance to our rest during the night and the heavy going through the soft dunes. But the men were cheerful because we were getting near to Kufra. The news that Buhalega, who lived at Hawari, the first halting place on the outskirts of Kufra, was going to slaughter a sheep and provide a feast, was an added incentive. The camels were weak and thin, but three of them, whose home is in Kufra, led the way all day without being driven, in spite of the difficult walking over the dunes. At 6.45, we sighted Garrett el Hawaria, the great landmark that indicates the approach to Kufra. Friday, March 30th. We started at 7.45 a.m., halted at 5.45 p.m., made 35 kilometers, and arrived at Hawari. A few drops of rain fell in the late evening. The ground was flat, soft sand, undulating a trifle, and marked with patches of black and red stone. At 9.30, we entered upon the zone of red sand of Kufra. We came across pieces of petrified wood all day. 
At 1.15 we passed Garrett el Hawaria, and at 3.30 sighted the date trees of Hawari. An hour and a half later, we entered the oasis and soon camped at Awadel. We had arrived at the first outpost of Kufra. This name was given in Rolf's time to the four somewhat widely separated oases of Taizerbo, Busima, Ribiana, and Kibabo, Rolf's designation for the present-day Kufra, but now it is restricted to the last named. Hawari is the northernmost part of the present Kufra, a comparatively small oasis with the three villages of Hawari, Awawira, and Awadel. Seventeen kilometers south lies El Taj, the seat of local government and the principal settlement. It is situated on a rocky cliff overlooking the depression of the oasis proper, which lies to the south and contains the villages of Jof, Boema, Muma, El Zurich, El Talib, and El Tolab. I had intended to go straight on to El Taj, the chief town of Kufra, the next day, but Buhalega claimed the right of hospitality and insisted that I should stop a day at the oasis which is his home. After a good night's rest, undisturbed by sandstorms or collapsing of tents, and a shave, I was quite ready to do full justice to the breakfast sent by the Bedouins of a caravan which had just arrived from Wadai. At the same time, I gathered some interesting information which made me consider making a change in my plans. I sent a messenger on to El Taj with letters to Sayyid El Abid, the cousin of Sayyid Idris and the chief Sanusi in Kufra, and to Jadawi, Sayyid Idris's personal wakil. In the afternoon, Zerwali escorted me to Hawari, where I was received at the Zawiya by the Ikwan and the notables of the town. After the usual words of welcome and exchange of compliments, I went to dinner at the house of Zerwali's uncle. The Bedouin chiefs protested that I should not have come direct to Hawari, but should have camped outside to give them an opportunity for a ceremonial reception. They had apparently heard how I was received at Jallo, and would have liked to duplicate it for me here. I heard rumors of intrigues among some of the Zawea chiefs, who were suspicious of my purpose in coming a second time to Kufra, and, as a protest, had refused to attend the dinner. They were influential chiefs, and the news made me determined to press on to El Taj before they could send word there in prejudice of my coming. After the meal, I rode home through the beautiful moonlight, and on my arrival found a difficult task before me. Egalia, Buhalega's eldest son, had been bitten by a scorpion. With more confidence in my medicine chest than I had myself, Buhalega asked that I should cure him. I took the anti-scorpium serum and went to his house, where I found the boy very ill indeed, burning with fever. At the last moment before leaving Cairo, these serums had been included in my equipment, and a doctor friend, while he was shaking my hand and I was saying goodbye to people all around me, explained to me, perhaps most lucidly, just how to employ the serums. It was the first time I had ever attempted that kind of injection, and I tried to conjure up the scene and recall fragments of those parting instructions. But it only struck me how different was that dimly lit room with the anxious friends and relatives watching my every movement from the hearty send-off when the serum had been added to my stock and trade. However, in spite of my doubts whether the case was not too far advanced for treatment, I administered the serum and went to my camp wondering what the outcome would be. Before long, I heard a crowd approaching my tent with loud outcries, which sounded hostile to my ears. Probably, I thought the boy was already dead, and his death would be laid at my door instead of at that of the scorpion. I summoned my men to protect the box of instruments, which I suspected would be the first object of attack, and prepared myself for a hostile approach. It was a disturbing moment. But great was my relief when I detected in the cries of those who were coming a note rather of rejoicing than of hostility. Presently, Buhalega entered my tent and thanked me with impressive warmth for the relief which I had given his son. It was like magic, he declared with fervor. Allah is great. That medicine of yours has made the boy well again. 
In appropriate terms, I answered, recovery comes from God. Already the fever was abating, and the boy evidently on his way to recovery. I thank God internally for the good fortune which had attended my ministrations. If the boy had died, my position would have been a dangerous one. When my visitors had left, I went out into the moonlight for a walk among the graceful palms. End of section 12「fourteen, Kufra, Old Friends and a Change of Plan」Sunday, April 1st. We started at 9.45 a.m. and halted at 2 p.m., making 17 kilometers, and arrived at El Taj. At 11.15 we entered a broken, rocky country, very rolling, covered with patches of black and red sandstone, until we reached Taj. Egalia came to help in loading the camels. He had quite recovered from his scorpion bite and was to go with us to Taj. Breakfast was sent by Buhalega for me and my men. When I protested that he should not have taken the trouble, he retorted that I should have given him an opportunity to provide the customary three days' hospitality. A little later, a slave girl came from him with a huge bowl of rice, chicken, and eggs. She was evidently dressed especially for the occasion and was quite charming in her dainty attire of blue cloth with a red sash about her slim waist. I told her that we were starting at once and should not need the food. You may need it on the way, she whispered shyly. I cooked it myself. If that is the case, I assured her, I will accept it gladly. She was obviously pleased and immediately went back for another bowl quite as large and inviting. I bowed to the inevitable and sent my thanks to her master. We were given a pleasant send-off by the people of Awadel, and I set out at the head of my caravan on Buhalega's horse. We needed no guide just now, for I knew the way myself. Aye, the bay knows the way too well, said Sunusi ben Hassan. He will soon become a guide in this country of ours. The approach to Kufra from the north has an element of surprise in it that makes it doubly interesting. We march through a gently rolling country with an irregular ridge of no great height forming the horizon ahead of us. Suddenly the top of the ridge resolved itself into the outlines of a group of buildings, their walls hard to distinguish at any distance from the rocks and sands they match so well in color and in form. This was El Taj, the headquarters of the Sanusi family in Kufra. As we entered the town, we saw that the ground dropped abruptly away beyond it, down to the valley of Kufra. This pleasant valley is a shallow, roughly shaped oval bowl, 40 kilometers in extent on its long diameter, and 20 kilometers on the short one. It is dotted with palm trees, and across it, in an irregular line from northeast to southwest, are strung the six settlements of Boema, Buma, Jaff, Zurich, Talalib, and Tolab. Close to Jaff lie the blue, shimmering waters of a fair-sized lake. At this midpoint in the sand waste of the desert, this expanse of water is both a boon and an aggravation. The mere sight of so much water brings refreshment to the eyes, weary of looking at nothing but sand, but to the parched throat it is worse than a mirage to the vision, for its waters are salt. On our entry into Taj, I was met cordially by old friends. Sayyid El Abid, the cousin of Sayyid Idris and the chief Senussi in Kufra, was ill with rheumatism, but Sidi Salah El Baskari, the Kaimakam, Sidi Mahmud El Jadawi, Sayyid Idris's wakil, and several Ikwin brought words of welcome from him and conducted me to the house of Sayyid Idris, where I was to stay. It was here that we had lived on the first trip to Kufra, two years before, and immediately I felt at home. "'You will have to initiate your men into the ways of Kufra,' said El Baskari whimsically. "'Even Zerwali has not been here for thirteen years.' At once the hospitality began, with coffee brought by the commandant to the troops. I had just time for a short rest before a slave came to take me to the house of Sayyid El Abid for a meal. Led by the same messenger that came for us two years ago, 
I walked through the same streets and entered the same wonderful house of the Senussi leader with a curious feeling as though time had stood still or gone back. Elabid's house is a labyrinth of corridors lined with doors behind which lived the members of the family and his retainers. We passed into the familiar room whose spaces seem more richly adorned than ever with gorgeous rugs, many-colored cushions, and stiffly embroidered brocades. On the walls hang the well-remembered collection of clocks, barometers, and thermometers in which my host takes naive delight. The clocks, of which there are at least a dozen of assorted shapes and sizes, were all going strong. Sidi Sala came to bear me company and to apologize for the enforced absence of my host, Sayed El Abid. There was set before me a feast fit for the gods, or for mortals fresh from the monotonous living of the desert. Lamb, rice, vegetables, mulukia, an Egyptian vegetable rather like spinach, delicious bread, sweet vinegar, milk, sweets, followed by coffee, milk with almond pulp beaten up in it, and finally the ceremonial three glasses of tea, flavored with amber, rose water, and mint. When the meal was over and I had returned to my house, I had barely time to see about the disposition of my baggage and discuss the question of camels for the next stage of the journey when the slave came to conduct me again to El Abid's house for dinner. El Bascari was again my host, a dignified, kindly figure in a beautiful gibba of yellow and gold, having changed the classical soft Bedouin tarbush which he had been wearing for a white silk kufia and a green and gold egal. When the second meal had reached the point of scented tea and incense, suddenly the clocks began to strike, each with its own particular tone, the Arabic hour of three, which then meant nine by the standard of the outside world. I closed my eyes for a moment and felt myself back in Oxford with the hours striking an endless variety of tones from all the church towers of the university town. I went out into the moonlight with the fragrance of the rose water and the incense lingering about me. I stood on the edge of the ridge overlooking the waters of the lake and reflected on my former visit to Kufra when this was my goal. Now it was the beginning of the most interesting part of my journey. I heard the voices of Iqban and students reading the hesp in the evening quiet. Abdullah, he slipped out of the shadows and stood beside me. This is the night of half Shaban, meaning the middle of the month before Ramadan, he said in a low tone as a man who thinks aloud. God will grant the wishes of one who prays tonight. For several minutes we two stood there silently. My face was toward the southeast, where lay an untrodden track and oases that are lost, but Abdullahi turned to the northeast, where lies Egypt and his family and children. I did not need to ask him for what he prayed. Monday, April 2nd. At Hawari, I had been told by the Bedouin caravan from Wadai that a French patrol had come north as far as the well at Sara over the main trade route from Wadai to Kufra. This was the route I had intended at first to follow, but it seemed that only the small portion of it which lay between Sara and Kufra remained unexplored. Again, I had heard vague stories of the lost oases on the direct route south, which I had planned some time to explore, although I knew that this direct route to Darfur in the Sudan was practically never used either by Bedouins or by Sudanese because of its supposed difficulties and dangers. The story of the French patrol turned my mind again to these oases, and I determined to try and find them rather than to follow my original plan. I set out, deciding to do all that was possible to explore these lost oases, but failing that, I was to cross the Libyan desert by the beaten road through Wajunga and Wadai, and then turn eastward toward Darfur. Zerwali and Suleiman Bu Matari, a rich Zawaya merchant, came to discuss the trip southward. Bumatari had discouraging counsel to offer as to the route I had now decided to take. Eight years ago, he said, the last caravan to go that way, of which my brother, Mohammed, was the leader, was eaten up and slaughtered on the frontier of Darfur. They went, not as you wish to go, but by the easier route from Uanat to Merenga, a small oasis about 290 kilometers south of Uanat. 
this journey you propose to make is through territory where no bedouin has passed before the daffa a long waterless trek between Uanat and Erdi is long and a hazardous one. God be merciful to the caravan in such heat. Your camels will drop like birds before the hot south winds. Even if you get through safely, who knows how the inhabitants of the hills over there will receive you. Do not let your anxiety to travel fast overrule your wisdom and keep you from choosing the safe trade route to Wajanga and Abishi. I thanked him for his advice, but I knew that I should not take it. After luncheon, royally provided by El Abid, I went to visit his son, Sharufa. He is an intelligent young man, thirsting for knowledge. He has gone as far into the outside world as Benghazi, and that by no means metropolitan community is still for him the city of the world. He apologized for the illness of his father, and I offered to send medicine, which might possibly help him. Tuesday, April 3rd. It was very warm, with heavy clouds and a bad southwest wind. After luncheon, as usual, I went to visit Shams Eldin, a cousin of Sharufa, and his younger brother. The older boy is very intelligent, and has eyes that seem to be asking questions of the world. They offered me three cups of milk with almond pulp, and a homemade jam. I knew that to refuse such an offer is to offend, so I left the house in a state of torpor. Dinner later at Sayed El Abid's did not improve matters internally. Again I discussed the plan of going by way of Arkanu and Uanat. I was more determined than ever. We would see what Buhalega had to say when he arrived from Hawari. Wednesday, April 4th. I was awakened by Jedawi, who, as usual, brought me a pot of fragrant tea. This is comparative civilization, I thought, as I saw Ahmed preparing my shaving kit. There are, of course, times when one welcomes the conveniences and comforts of civilization, but having trekked so far, one feels more at home when on the move than when resting in an oasis. The early part of the day was spent in cutting down most of the wooden boxes and rearranging the luggage in preparation for the long trip south. It required particular care, since from now onward there would be no chance of changing the camels until our arrival at El Fasher in the Sudan, about 950 miles. The question of providing new shoes for the men of my caravan had to be attended to, as the Bedouin shoes that were made for them at Jallo had been worn out. Before lunch, I had a visit from a few Zawaya chiefs who came officially to pay their respects and also unofficially to satisfy their curiosity and suspicion as to the size of my caravan and the equipment I was carrying and, if possible, to find out what plans I had made for my journey to the Sudan. Lunch, as usual, at Sayed El Abid's. I had the cheerful news that the medicine I gave him had a good effect. The afternoon I spent in attending to the question of arms and ammunition. Later I took a long walk in order to make the compass observations of the vicinity of Taj. Thursday, April 5th. Sir Wally had a long talk with Buhalega, who arrived in the night from Hawari. The latter refused point blank to go to El Fasher by the Uanat route. Buhalega came to visit me and tried to persuade me to go by way of Wadai. When he saw that his advice would probably not be taken, he became desperate. I had clearly pointed out to him that nothing could change my decision to cut across by the Uanat route to El Fasher. By God, it's a dangerous route, he said, and many a caravan has been eaten up by the inhabitants of the hills on the way. They do not fear God, and they are under the authority of no man. They are like birds. They live on the tops of mountains, and you will have trouble with them. We are men, and we are believers, I responded. Our fate is in the hands of God. If our death is decreed, it may come on the beaten track to the nearest well. Many as a way a beard has been buried in those unknown parts, he declared. The people are treacherous, and they fear neither God nor man. May God's mercy fall on those Zawayans who have lost their lives, I replied. Our lives are no more precious than theirs. 
Shall our courage be less? The water on this route is scarce and bad, he argued again. God has said, Do not throw yourselves with your own hands unto destruction. God will quench the thirst of the true believer, I answered, and will protect those who have faith in him. He felt himself in danger of being beaten in argument and shifted his ground. None of my men are willing to accompany you on this route, he asserted, and I cannot send my camels either. It is sending them to death. If you find anybody who is willing to hire his camels, I am ready to pay for them, but neither my men nor my camels are going to take you on this journey. Do what you like, I retorted with spirit. I am going by this route. It will be between you and Sayyid Idris when he knows that Bu Halega has not kept his word. There the argument rested. I had already learned that the few owners of camels at Kufra had been urged by Bu Halega and his men not to help me in my new plan. He hoped by so doing to force me to accept his plan of the safe route through Wadai. An enormous lunch was provided by Jadawi. The three days of official hospitality of El Abid having ended yesterday, Jadawi, as Idris's wakil at Kufra, can now entertain us. Buhalega was about to leave, but I invited him to partake of our meal, and he accepted. He hoped still to persuade me to change my mind. I hoped even more strongly to convince the old man that the route was not as dangerous as he made it out to be. After the third glass of tea, we parted, neither of us having succeeded in convincing the other. But I felt that my last words had an effect on him. In the afternoon, the slave came to tell me that his master, Sayyid el Abid, would like to see me. I had already intimated that he need not be in a hurry to give me an audience, as I knew he was suffering badly from his gout, and it was very difficult for him to come down to the reception room. But he was not willing to have me think that he had violated the rules of hospitality by delaying the audience, and so he very kindly allowed me to see him in spite of his suffering. It was the first time that I had seen Sayyid El Abid on this journey, and as I was ushered into his presence, I thought that he might have come out of a gorgeous illustration of the Thousand and One Nights. He was dressed in a yellow silk kuftan, embroidered with red braid, a rich white silk burnous carefully hung on his shoulders. On his head, he wore a white turban with snow-white gauze flowing from the sides. This is the classical headgear of the chiefs of the Senussi family. He carried in his hand a heavy ebony stick with a massive silver head. He was a picture of simple and benign dignity, and no one would have suspected him of being the redoubtable warrior that he really is. He was sitting on a big upholstered armchair, and as I entered, he tried to get up. I hastened to him, grasping his hand, and begged him not to make an effort to rise. He was suffering badly from his gout, and the conversation started easily on the subject of his ailment. He has been suffering for many years. At times at night, he said, when the pain is at its worst, I pray to God that he may shorten the number of my days in this world, for I cannot even perform my prayers as I should. We then discussed the question of my trip to the Sudan, and he too, I found, had been prevailed upon to urge me to take the safer route through Wadai. I pointed out to him that Said Idris was now in Egypt and that I had to hasten to my country to try to repay a little of the hospitality that had been lavished upon me by the Senussis. It was fortunate that the route to the Sudan through Uanat is known to be shorter than that through Wadai. You are a dear friend of ours, he said, and the Said, I am sure, would rather have you arrive in Egypt late and safe than to hear that any harm had befallen you. Our fates are in the hands of God, I replied. Our efforts are decreed by him, and I carry with me the blessing of the Senussi masters. I spoke with an air of determination. Sayyid El Abid was pensive for a few moments. Slowly he raised his head and lifted his two hands toward heaven. May God make your efforts succeed and send you back safe to your people, he said, yielding to my desire. You have visited the tomb of our grandfather at Jagbub and the Kuba of Sidi el-Mahdi here, and you have their blessings. 
He who struggles and has faith is rewarded by God. He quoted from the Quran. We then read the Fatah, and he gave me his blessing, and again prayed that God might guide our steps and give me and my men fortitude. I felt very happy as I wound my way through this multitude of corridors and courtyards. I was relieved to know that I had an ally in Sayyid el Abid, and that he would not prove an obstacle in my new plan of going to the Sudan by way of Uanat. All the men of my caravan were there when I entered the house. One look at their faces told me with what suppressed excitement they had been waiting since my departure to Sayyid el Abid to hear his verdict on the journey south. Slowly, I made my way to my room and asked them to come in. I, too, had to suppress my excitement, but mine was the excitement of success and not of expectation. There was a long pause before I could control my voice and make it as indifferent as it should be. The Sayyid has blessed our journey to Uanat and has given me the fata for it. I dared not even look into men's faces. We have the blessings of the Senussi masters with us, Sayyid el Abid has assured me, and God will give us fortitude and success, and guidance comes from him. End of section 13「Kufra – Its Place on the Map」Friday, April 6th. The day began with the arrival of an immense bowl of roses, gloriously fragrant, sent by Sayyid el Abid. This is the way the desert belies its name every now and then. I defy the Riviera to produce anything finer than these, or more fragrant. It was Friday, the Moslem Sabbath, and I attended prayers at the mosque. The young Senussi princes were expected, and some of the Bedouins came in their best clothes, but side by side with the richest of silk kuftans were the shabbiest jurds. Everyone took off his slippers as they came in. I watched them for a while. There came a prosperous Sawaya or Majbari merchant with a crease still fresh in rich robes just removed from the chest and coal in his eyes put in with a madwid, a coal stick, of ivory or brass. The prosperous man maybe has everything upon him new, and he smells strongly of scent, perhaps pure rose water distilled in Kufra, or else musk or other strong perfume from the Sudan. He enters in a dignified way and takes his place. There comes another, and his jurd is tattered and his face is bronzed and withered, not flabby, but he is no less dignified. Clothes play but a small part in this assembly because of the natural dignity and courage of these people, and those qualities are brought out in relief even more by the tattered jurd than by the fine silks and scents, which sometimes take away something of the personality of the individual. A slave comes. He is the favorite slave and confidant of one of the Senussi chiefs. His silks are as rich and even more vivid, and there is little to suggest servility. He feels his importance and walks with equally dignified grace through the ranks of the worshippers to take his place, maybe next to a dignitary, maybe next to a beggar. At the mosque, the poor not only stand on level ground with the rich and the prosperous, but in a subtle way they have their revenge. For in the house of God, the master is God, and the beggar may feel as great or greater than the rich man, since he is not submerged in the luxury of the world and forgetting God. The old and shabby jurd is, to the Bedouin going into the mosque, as fit a garment for worship as silken brocades are proper raiment for a man going to see the Senussi chiefs. The worshippers are now ready. The Mazayan has finished his call to prayer. There is a hush. The young Senussi princes are entering the mosque. They take their places that have been reserved for them. All eyes turn toward them, and on account of their youth, they look a little shy and embarrassed. No one rises as they enter, for this is the house of God, wherein God alone is the master. Then the imam mounts the pulpit and delivers his sermon. On the few occasions that I have been able to attend Friday prayers in an oasis mosque, the theme of the sermon has often been the same, advising the congregation to shun the world and its luxury and to prepare for a life of happiness in the next world by doing good. Beware the ornaments and the luxuries of this world, 
for they are very enticing. Once you fall a victim to them, you lose your soul and stray farther from God. Draw nearer to God by doing good deeds and obeying his commands. This life will pass away. Only the next world is everlasting. Prepare yourselves for it, that you may be happy in eternity. The interior of this mosque is beautiful in the simple dignity of its lines. The walls are bare, whitewashed, scrupulously clean. The floor is covered with rugs or with fiber matting. The worshippers squat cross-legged upon the floor in a very reverent attitude. There are perhaps two hundred of them, ranged in rows, all facing toward Mecca. There are some who count their prayers upon rosaries of amber beads. Others, too poor to have rosaries, record the number of their prayers by opening and closing their fingers. There are some whose every movement betrays opulence and prosperity. Others, Bedouins of the desert, have a faraway look. The most striking impression is the serenity and contentment written on their faces. Even upon the pinched and haggard face, there is an expression of equanimity which shows that the man has accepted his fate. It is written there that he is living on the verge of starvation, yet he does not rebel. After lunch at El Abid's, Solomon Bumatari came again to talk about the trip south. He reported that Buhalega and Mohammed, who was to be our guide, had met and talked things over, but Buhalega was still unwilling to go. Abdullahi had spent the day at Jaff gathering what information he could about the Uanat route and trying to find out if the Tibus would let me hire camels from them for the journey thither. After dinner at El Abid's, I spent some time in Sayyid Idris's library, which he had instructed Jadawi to throw open to me. Imagine a room of medium size filled with chests containing books. The ceiling is decorated in vivid colors, the work of an artist, a lover of the Senussis, who came from Tunis simply to do them a service, just as in medieval Europe, painters and sculptors devoted their lives to adorning churches. Every bit of wood in the room has come from Egypt or Benghazi. There is a window open to the air with only wooden shutters as a protection against the sun. It is not easy to move about, for books and chests of books are arranged along the walls and in the middle of the room as well. There are many very ancient chests used as cupboards and at the same time fitted with attachments at the sides which enable them to be straightaway loaded upon a camel in case of need. The library is somewhat out of order, books piled carelessly one on top of another, for Sayyid Idris has long been absent. There is a great number of manuscripts enclosed in beautifully tooled Morocco covers. There are modern books printed in Cairo and in India. There are manuscripts from Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia. With the exception of a few books in the Persian language, all are in Arabic. There are two or three manuscripts of the Koran illuminated in gold. It was a great privilege for me to be allowed to go into this library, for as a rule, no one is admitted. I found many manuscripts laboriously written on ancient parchment, works on philosophy, the Arab language, theology, Sufism, a few on poetry and mysticism, another on talismans and magic. Many were the interesting and pleasant hours that I spent among the collection. The surroundings and atmosphere were just right, so remote, so many miles from the world, one felt in the mood to absorb the thought to be found in these manuscripts. Sit in a comfortable chair in the midst of civilization and try to read such books. One ring of the telephone would be enough to make them appear archaic. Saturday, April 7th. A fine pair of shoes came as a present from Sharufa. The chief of the Zawayas came to pay me another visit. We talked over our coffee about Zawaya history. I learned that it was not the Zawayas who first conquered Kufra from the Tibus, but the Gawasi and Jahama tribes. The names of two of the Kufra villages, Talab and Zurich, are family names of the Jahama tribe. I gave each of my visitors a photograph of the group which I had taken several days before and they were delighted with them. I realized to the full that day the perils of Kufra. Rolfs almost lost his life here by violence. 
I almost lost mine by kindness. I lunched prodigally at Ella Bede's as usual, and the meal was followed by coffee, three glasses of tea with amber rose water and mint, and three glasses of milk enriched with almond pulp. The Sharufa insisted that I should come to his house and offered me three glasses of perfumed tea, followed again by three glasses of almond-flavored milk. I reflected that to refuse was to offend and gulped down the beverages, which by now had become somewhat nauseating. The end was not yet. Shams el Din hauled me off to his house and set before me biscuits and nuts and a huge glass of sweet syrup. It was almost more than flesh and blood could endure, but to refuse was to offend. There followed three glasses of coffee, but I stalked forth with all the dignity of a man going to the gallows or the Spartan boy with a fox gnawing at his vitals. As I lay down in my room to recuperate, Many thoughts surged through my brain. Would that the Bedouin, whoever he was, who selected three as the mystic number to characterize desert hospitality, had died unborn. But it was lucky that he did not hit on seven instead of three. I came to the desert perfectly prepared for destruction by the hand of nature or hostile man, but the idea of perishing through indigestion did not commend itself to my sense of the fitness of things. And yet, at the proper time, I went to Ella Bede's again for dinner. Some of the Bedouin chiefs were my fellow guests, and once more the route to the southward was discussed. Buhalega persisted in his refusal to go by way of Uanat. The conditions laid down by Sayed Idris, he said, called for a journey to Wadai and not to Darfur. He would send neither his camels nor his men that way. I argued like a lawyer that since he had contracted to provide 35 marhalas, or days' journeys, from Kufra southward, it should make no difference to him whether I used those marhalas to go to Wadai or to El Fasher or back to Egypt. He was unconvinced by this ingenious reasoning, but when he realized that I was determined, that El Abid was not opposed to my plan, and that I was willing to take fewer camels than originally stipulated, he gave a reluctant consent, but he would not go himself or send his men. Sunday, April 8th. The affair of Bu Halega's horse came to a head. I bought him for 33 pounds. He was sturdy and a splendid traveler, needing to drink only every second day. After luncheon, I took El Abid's photograph and had a long talk with him about his malady, which he bore with true Bedouin fortitude, about conditions in Cyrenaica and Egypt, and about my plans for the trip to the Sudan. I had had bad luck with my scientific work at Kufra. I did not find it easy to escape surveillance and move about unattended, or to use my instruments without arousing suspicion. What was worse, it had been cloudy every day since I arrived there, and I had been unable to take observations of the sun or Polaris with the theodolite. After dinner, I was thoroughly tired. I had used up all the indigestion tablets which I brought with me. I felt that it would be a relief to get back to the simplicity of the open desert again. Monday, April 9th, was still cloudy, but a cool breeze was blowing. I spent a quiet day reading in Idris's library, developing a few films, and buying gerbas and barley for the journey. Sayed El Abid gave me copies written with his own hand, of letters by El Mahdi to various Ikwan. He made me presents of a Moorish knife and a silver scabbard and a flintlock pistol, also beautifully inlaid. Tuesday, April 10th. The clouds cleared away in the afternoon and I took photographs of the valley. I arranged with a shoemaker for shoes for myself and my men and for bandoliers which the men insisted on having in view of the alarming rumors they had been hearing. I met Mohammed Sukkar, who was to be our guide over the Uanat route for the first time, and liked him. Wednesday, April 11th. El Abid had heard of my purchase of Buhalega's horse, and sent me a Tuareg sword and an Italian carbine to carry when I ride him. At last I was able to make observations with my theodolite. I was anxious to see how my results would agree with those of Rolf's. Thursday, April 12th. 
I sent Sayed el Abid my shotgun as a gift. In the afternoon, I rode with Sayed Muhammad Butamanya and Zerwali Tajaf. We were met by the chiefs of the village. I visited the souk, where the weekly market was being held, the Zawiya, which is the oldest Sanusi school in Kufra, and the mosque. Jaff is the trade center of Kufra. It was interesting to find side by side in the souk rifle cartridges whose markings showed them to be 30 years old, Italian tomato sauce in tins from Benghazi, blue and white calico made in Manchester and imported from Egypt, and leather, ivory, and ostrich feathers from Wadai. These products of the south, however, are not plentiful now in Kufra, except when a merchant who has brought them from Wadai is prevented, for some reason, from going on to the north to sell them in Egypt or Cyrenaica. Kufra had seen its best days as a trade center before the occupation of the Sudan. Then it was easier to find an outlet for the products of Wadai and Darfur through Kufra than by way of the country to the east. Even now, however, there is a contraband trade through Kufra in female ivory and ivory of less than 14 pounds weight, the exportation of which is prohibited by the Sudan government. In addition to the trade that passes through Kufra, most of the big Zawaya chiefs who have enough slaves go in for agriculture. They raise barley and maize. The Sanusis are more progressive and grow melons, grapes, bananas, marrows, and other vegetables of the more delicate kinds, all of which are a great treat after the monotonous fare of the desert. They raise mint and roses, from which they make the rose water and mint essence so essential in their ceremonies of hospitality. From a few olive trees, some olive oil is produced in primitive presses. The animals of Kufra are camels, sheep, donkeys, and a few horses. Meat, however, is very expensive as there is little grazing for sheep in the valley. The animals are fed on pounded date stones, which do very well as a staple diet, but some green stuff is necessary at intervals. The Sanusis, who are in everything more progressive than their neighbors, raise chickens and pigeons. The price of slaves, I learned at Kufra, has risen a great deal during the last few years because there are no more slaves coming up from Wadai on account of the vigilance of the French authorities in that province. Occasionally, the Bedouins get around this by contracting a marriage with a slave girl in Wadai, and then, when they come back, divorcing and selling her. On one of my travels in 1916, I was offered a slave girl for six gold louis, 120 francs. Now the price varies from 30 to 40 pounds. A male slave costs less. The Bedouins sometimes marry their slave girls, and if one of these bears a male child, she automatically becomes free. The Bedouins have no prejudice against color. That is, if the slave bears the head of a tribe, his eldest male child, that child, ipso facto, becomes in his turn the head of the tribe, however black he may be. Whereas the children of slaves are slaves, the child of a slave girl and a free man, however poor, is always free, and even though his father dies and he is left an orphan, he can never be a slave. The lot of a favorite male slave especially is preferable. They have more power and are taken more into the confidence of their masters than free men. They are very well treated and become members of the family. They are well dressed, for an ill-dressed slave reflects badly on his master just as a shabby footman would detract from the glory of a millionaire's Rolls Royce. The favorite slave of Sayyid Idris, Ali Kaja, is not only the most trusted man of Sayyid Idris, but he has more power and authority among the Bedouins themselves than many a free man. Such a slave is treated as a confidant. If the slave of Sayyid El Abid came to me with a message, I took it to be absolutely true, knowing that it is his duty to report exactly what he is told. In the same way, if I wished something to reach the ears of Sayyid El Abid, and only his ears, I knew that I could tell it without a moment's hesitation to his slave, and be perfectly confident that it would not go anywhere else. A man's slave is permitted to buy a slave girl. Once, when I asked Ali Khaja about the price of slaves, he complained, they are very expensive nowadays. 
The other day I bought one, and she cost me forty pounds in gold sovereigns. He said it with such an air that he might never have been a slave himself. The shabbiest slave that you see in an oasis is generally the freed slave, who, curiously enough, is looked down upon by the other owned slaves and himself feels ashamed that he's a freed slave and belongs to no one. There are many date trees all through the Kufra Valley, and many of them belong to the Sanusis. When the Zawayas invited Sidi ibn Ali al Sanusi to come to Kufra, each one of them gave the Sanusis one third of his property, land, and date trees. The proportion of two to one between the date trees owned by the Zawayas and those of the Sanusis has, however, in the years since then, been considerably altered in favor of the Zawayas. These regular inhabitants of the valley naturally planted new trees faster and thus increased their own holdings. One can still see in the valley the walls separating the Sanusi lands from those of the Zawayas. On our way back from Joff, we met a wedding party. The officer commanding the troops at Kufra was being married, and the father of the bride invited me to empty gunpowder in honor of the occasion. I was glad to pay a compliment to the officer, who was an old friend of mine, and when they fired their guns in salute, in good Bedouin style, I rode my horse at a gallop up to the party, pulled him to a sudden halt in front of the bride, and fired my gun into the ground before her. It was astonishing how Baraka, the moment he heard the sound of the guns, took to a gallop and brought me at a rush within the prescribed distance for firing. It was all a part of his training. Friday, April 13th. A slave of Sayyid Idris came to be treated for an illness which had lasted for two months. It seemed to be a digestive upset with continual vomiting. I gave him ether on a piece of sugar, milk, and rice, and by evening he was better. Buhalega arrived from Hawari with 17 camels. I told him to complete the 25 we had agreed upon. I received a visit from the bridegroom and his father-in-law, who came to thank me for the compliment I paid to the wedding procession. Saturday, April 14th. Buhalega brought the rest of the camels. He was in a dilemma about sending a man with us. He did not wish to send his son or even a slave on such a hazardous journey which none of us might get through alive. On the other hand, there was the off chance that fate might be good to us and let us escape. In that case, remote though it seemed to him, if he had no representative with us, how should he get his camels back, or rather their value? For it would be the natural thing to sell them at the end of the trip. The afternoon was spent in packing, and the evening in making observations. The weather was now more gracious. This was only the third night since reaching the spot that I had been able to see Polaris. I determined that I would not leave Kufra until I had made at least twice as many observations on different nights. Sunday, April 15th. The morning was spent in loading. Buhalega was still in a quandary about sending a man with us, but since I had the camels, it did not make any particular difference to me what he decided. The slave whom I had been treating was astonishingly improved in health. He came to thank me. No one was more surprised than I at what I had been able to do for him. At two, the caravan set out for Azila, the last well of Kufra Valley on the south. There we were going to do tag hees properly, taking several days for perfecting our final preparations. I had bought two sheep for Busabar, as none of us had made this journey before. All my men had been newly clothed and made a cheerful sight in spotless white with red shoes. Their carefully cleaned rifles glittered as they hung on their backs. Most of the new camels looked fresh and strong. Monday, April 16th. Abdullahi took the horse to Taj for shoeing, as I found that the stony ground was too hard for him. I sent a brass tray to the commandant as a wedding present, and the last three bottles of Bovril to Idris's sick slave. Our departure was postponed because the guide was still occupied before the caddy with a legal matter over a camel. Tuesday, April 17th. I had breakfast at Solomon Matari's in Joff with Sir Wali Abdullahi, the Commandant, Salah, and Mohammed Bu Tamania. 
the rest poked fun at the commandant because, being a new bridegroom, he would not partake of a dish cooked with onions. They do not forgive when they are young, said Bu Tamania, winking at the commandant. I bought a hedgin, or trotting camel, for my own use, paying nine pounds for it. We were, at last, ready for the start the next day. As I made my last observation of Polaris, I had a strong hope that I should have succeeded in putting Kufra into its proper place on the map. I had been keen to check Rolf's determination of the position of Kufra, which he made from the observations of his companion Stecker at Boma. Taj had not been built in Rolf's day. When I made my first observation at Taj, I discovered that they were not in agreement with the result of Stecker's observations at Boma, which is two kilometers from Taj in a direction 54 degrees east of true south. I thereupon determined that I would not leave Kufra until I had secured a sufficient number of observations to preclude the possibility of any appreciable error. Polaris was observed with the theodolite by me on six different nights, under conditions which Dr. Ball, in his scholarly paper on my work published at the end of this volume, declares to leave no room for an error greater than a single minute of latitude or longitude. The net result of my observations, when they were finally reduced after my return to Egypt, was that Kufra is some 40 kilometers south-southeast of the position assigned to it by Rolfs from Stecker's observations. I found the altitude of Kufra to be almost precisely the same as that ascertained by Rolfs, 400 meters for Boema on the floor of the valley, and 475 meters for Taj on the valley's ridge. End of section 14. Chapter 16. The Lost Oases, Our Canoe. Wednesday, April 18th. Bu Halega had at last found two men, Bukhara and Hamid, who would go with his camels. They were poor men, and the money they would make loomed larger in their eyes than the danger. Sayyid El Abid sent three representatives to see us off. They brought a letter of farewell from him that touched my heart. Buhalega came to say goodbye. At the final moment, there were tears in his eyes, and I do not think they were caused by fears for his camels or for the men whom he was sending with us. In spite of our controversy over the route, we remained true friends with affection and respect for each other. My men were greeted by their friends as though this was to be their last meeting. It was the most touching farewell of the whole journey. May God make safety your companion. What is decreed is decreed, and that will happen. May God guide you to the true road and protect you from evil. There was little about this parting of that sense of assurance which attends both those who go and those who stay behind when it is a case of starting for a holiday with some certitude of safe arrival. There were a few quivers in the last phrases of farewell, and knowing what had passed in the preceding days and the intimidation to which the men had been subjected, I could guess what was in their minds. Whereas I was excited by the thoughts of the lost oases and taking the unexplored road and going into the unknown, they were thinking that this might be the last time they would shake hands with their friends. There was even a pitying look on the faces of some of those who came to bid us Godspeed as to doomed men, yet being Bedouins they also felt, it is decreed that they should go thus. We recited the Fatha, the first chapter of the Koran. Praise be to God, the Master of the Universe, the Merciful, the Compassionate, the Lord of the Day of Resurrection. It is you whom we worship, and it is you whom we ask for help. Guide us to the straight path, the path of those whom you have rewarded, not those upon whom displeasure has fallen, nor those who have gone astray. Amen. There followed the call to prayers. God is great, and I testify that there is no God but God, and that Muhammad is the prophet of God. Haste to prayers, haste to that which is beneficent. Prayers are ready. God is great. There is no God but God. It was upon the edge of the valley of Kufra, where the oasis ends and the desert stretches out ahead. 
They had walked with us until then, and as we passed from the valley into the flat desert, we looked back upon the date palms. The sun was setting, dusk falling, and Kufra itself in the waning light was glimpsed as though through the aperture of a camera. Those who had come to say farewell straightaway returned and looked back no more. I was eager to get away from Kufra and let my men turn their minds to the task ahead. At last, the real start had been made. Before me, all was unknown, full of mystery and the fascination that lie in those parts of the earth's surface yet untraversed by men from the outside world. We started at 4.30 p.m. and halted at 8.15, making 15 kilometers. It was fine and clear with no wind. Hard sand covered with very fine gravel, slightly undulating. After leaving the date trees of Azila and Kufra, we crossed a zone of Hatab similar to that at Zigan and entered the Cerebra at 5.45. At 6.30 we passed hillocks which formed the south side of the valley of Kufra. At 8.15 we arrived at Hadiat el Hush, marked by dry Hatab, which must once have been green. We left two men behind to bring us two loads that were to be carried on Tibu camels. Our caravan comprised 27 camels and 19 persons. Myself, Sir Wally, Abdullahi, Ahmed, Hamad, Ismail, Sunusi Bu Hassan, Sunusi Bu Jaber, Hamad Zawai, Saad the Ajuli, Faraj the Slave, Bukhara and his young brother Hamid, the camel man Hassan, Mohammed our guide, and three Tibus. An entry from my diary again. Thursday, April 19th, start at 1.45 p.m., halt at 7.15 p.m., make 24 kilometers. Highest temperature 32 degrees, lowest 11. Fair and clear with a few white clouds. Southeast breeze which drops at midday. After leaving Hatyat el Hush, we enter the Sarira again, a flat expanse of hard sand covered with fine gravel. East of the Hatia is a chain of sand hillocks covered with dark brown stones. To the west is another similar chain about four kilometers away. At 2.15 we pass the end of the Hatia el Hush. The Hatia is about two kilometers broad. At 3.45 there is a gara on our left about two kilometers away, and at 5 another gara four kilometers distant on our right. At 6.30, the sand is softer, with patches of red and black stones. The surface is undulating. We were delayed in starting through waiting for the two camels which had been left behind, and used the time in collecting hatab. It was very warm, and the camels grew tired quickly because of the heat. The country was similar to that between Budafal and Zigan. With my new Hajin, I found it easy to fall behind to take observations without exciting suspicion. We had to camp early because of the condition of the camels. Friday, April 20th. Start at 2 a.m., halt at 9.30 a.m., start again at 3.30 p.m., and final halt at 8 p.m., make 48 kilometers, highest temperature 32 degrees, lowest 10 degrees at 12.30 a.m., fine and clear with cold southeast wind in the early morning. It drops at midday and gets up again at four. In the evening, it shifts to the northeast. At 4 a.m., passing through undulating country strewn with stone. At six, enter Sarira again, flatter. Sunrise is at 5.30. Immediately thereafter, on our right and left are low sand hills from eight to 10 kilometers distance. See a swallow in the morning and a hawk in the afternoon. At 4.20, cross low sand dunes inside a black gara, a long low mound, 10 degrees south of southeast. This was the worst part of the journey for traveling, so far as temperature conditions were concerned. In the middle of the day, it was too hot to march, and at night, it was too cold. So we broke the trek into two parts, starting soon after midnight and resting in the heat of the day. We had trouble with the baggage because of the difficulty of good packing and loading in the dark. The camels, however, went better on this day. This was the fourth day of the lunar month. The Bedouins observed the weather conditions on that day, believing that the weather for the rest of the month will be the same. It was to prove true in this case. 
Saturday, April 21st. We started at 2.30 a.m. At 6 in the morning, we came across stony and hilly country, which lasted for 12 kilometers. We passed on our left the gara called Garret Kuti. At 9, we entered again into Sarira, with distant sand dunes on the right and left. One camel fell ill shortly after our start and refused to go even when its load was taken off. Two Bedouins were left behind to bleed it, but all efforts at cure were in vain, and it had to be slaughtered. I forbade the Bedouins to eat its flesh. Later, after the midday halt, two Tibus dumped the loads from their camels and went back to dry the flesh and leave it until they returned from Uanat. They were to catch us later. This all delayed us about an hour. The men had little sleep the previous night, and we were very tired after sunrise but it was chiefly the intense heat from noon to four o'clock that exhausted both men and camels. It was a very tired caravan that started again at 4.30 p.m. and moved slowly along. I saw two hawks and fresh sleeping camps of birds on the sands. Sunday, April 22nd. We traveled over flat hard sand with occasional sand hillocks, three to ten meters high, covered with black stones. At 5.30 a.m. we sighted a chain of hills on our left running from north to southwest across our path. At 8 a.m. we entered into broken, hilly country, which continued all day. It was called Wadi El Marahig. We came across broken ostrich eggs. We had better loading today, but the men were tired. Many of them fell out to snatch a half-hour's sleep, catching up with the caravan when they woke. Bukhara brought me two little eagles, which he had taken from their nest on top of Agara. I ordered him to put them back, and saw that it was done. The hedgen was ill and had to go all the afternoon without load or even saddle. At the midday halt, the men fell asleep immediately and snored heavily. This kind of travel is grueling, tedious work, but we were getting on. Monday, April 23rd. We started at 2.30 a.m., halted at 9.15 a.m., second start at 3.45 p.m., halt at 9 p.m., making 46 kilometers. This was the most exhausting trek that I had yet known. For eight days, we had had only four hours of sleep a day. We had hardly started before the men with one accord fell back to snatch a half-hour sleep, leaving the camels to follow the will-o'-the-wisp of the guide's lantern. I could not avail myself of this privilege because of my anxiety for my instruments. The loading, done in the dark, was insecure, and a slipped fastening may mean a broken instrument or camera. At intervals, one or another camel would halt and kneel and refuse to get up. Then a tibu would come and press his thumb on a certain big vein in the camel's forehead and manipulate it. It seemed to give the beast relief. We were having a hard time of it crossing the high, steep sand dunes when suddenly the mountains rose before us like medieval castles half hidden in the mist. A few minutes later the sun was on them, turning the cold gray into warm rose and pink. I let the caravan go on, and for a half an hour I sat on the sand dune and let the sight of these legendary mountains do its will with my mind and heart. I had found what I came to seek. These were the mountains of our canoe. It was the outstanding moment of the whole journey. Any hardships I might have endured, any hardships that might still await me, were as nothing compared with the joy that filled me at the mere sight of these hills. It was not like going to seek a hidden treasure that had to be dug out of the ground. There they were, standing right up high before me, so that I might feast my eyes upon them. Up and down, up and down, we had plodded across the sand dunes in the chilly grayness of the hours before dawn, until suddenly, at the last dune, it was as though somebody had rung up a curtain upon these magical hills, of which I have not seen the like in the whole Libyan desert. From the time I left Solom until I reached this spot, there had been nothing like the mountains of Arcanu. The sight of them so gripped me that for a while I dreamed that I was not in the desert any more. Tuesday, April 24th, was the 111th day from Solemn and the 140th from Cairo. 
we covered broken country sand covered with stones undulating at five a m heavy sand dunes after the dunes the country became stony again and later there was hard sand covered with gravel north of arkanu mountain and only a hundred meters from it was a big sandstone hill about two kilometers long and a hundred meters or so high there was a glorious sunrise with shades of red and gold splashed on the few gray clouds in the east the cool wind soon dropped and it became close and warm arkanu mountain is a mass of granite its gray surface weathered to a ruddy brown rising uniformly along its length some five hundred meters from the desert surface it is made up of a series of conical masses which run together at their feet without intervals between them we approached it at its most western point as we came toward it we could not tell how far it extended to the east at the farthest point which we could see in that direction it rose into a peak we marched round the northwestern corner of the mountain mass and came to the entrance of a valley which runs to the eastward there is one solitary tree of the species called by the goran arkanu standing in the desert here from it the oasis takes its name we made our camp near it this was a bad spot for camel ticks who lived in the shade of the tree and came literally running by the score when our camels approached we were obliged to camp some distance from the tree as the insects did not seem to care to forsake its shade even to attack the camels i once picked up a tick that was like a piece of petrified stone i hit it with a stick and it just clicked like a piece of stone i turned away and pretended to be busy with something else it took about three or four minutes before it gave any sign of life the tick knows instinctively that safety lies in pretending to be petrified then without warning it scooted like lightning when there are no camels these ticks live on nothing they absorb the camel's blood get inflated and then they can live the bedouins say years but certainly a few months immediately on our arrival the camels were sent into the valley to be watered and to bring back the supply of water of which we were much in need two hours after we pitched camp the two tibus left behind arrived with a supply of meat from the slaughtered camel which was eaten with enthusiasm for dinner a hot gusty wind blew all the afternoon while i was resting in my tent i was suddenly aroused by something tickling my ear and tried to brush it away without discovering what it was in that moment a gust of wind blew in one of the side walls of the tent which had been raised for ventilation and i felt something darting across my body i grasped at it instinctively and fortunately for my peace of mind missed it it was a snake some four feet long which was subsequently caught by my men and despatched the men held a shooting competition in the afternoon it started as a perfunctory affair but the interest quickened when i put up a medjidi a turkish dollar as a prize sanusi bujaber though short-sighted won the contest hamid expressed the feelings of the other contestants when he said it was the medjidi that worked on my emotions and made me nervous i had hit the mark before i made observations and took photographs and incidentally treated the guide's teeth goran the black tribes of the neighborhood suddenly appeared from the valley and were kept to dine with my men no one had dreamed of their presence until they appeared the mountain looked desolate and deserted and one would not suspect that inside it lies a fertile valley which is inhabited as a matter of fact our canoe is not inhabited all the year round in the valley is good vegetation to which in the past bedouins tibus and goran brought their camels during the grazing season they closed the entrances to the valley with rocks and left the camels there unattended for three months when they came to take them back said mohammed the guide they had as much fat on them as this he put his closed fists one on top of the other wednesday april twenty fifth the goran family in the valley brought a sheep milk and salmon which was butter in a curious liquid state because of the heat as a diapha or hospitality they also drove their sheep to the camp to be milked for the men of the caravan after luncheon i rode into arkanu valley with zerwali and bukhara 
it is a carcour or narrow winding valley extending some fifteen kilometers back into the mountains there are grass shrubs and an occasional tree we visited the goran hut where i took photographs of a girl and two boys of the family the boys wore white robes the sign of the sons of a sheik when i got back to camp i sent presents of cloth handkerchiefs and rice for the three children it was a beautiful moonlit night i decided to spend three days more at arkanu because the grazing was good and the camels still seemed tired from their hard trek my hedgen was doing well i picked up stones for geological specimens and aroused the suspicions of some of my men they thought there was gold in what stones i had picked up or else i would not take the trouble to carry them back home thursday april twenty sixth at arkanu highest temperature thirty six degrees lowest nine degrees fine and clear with very strong and hot southeast wind twice the wind blew the tents down we sent the camels to be watered and to graze it was a sweltering day over one hundred degrees fahrenheit in the tent and only a little less in the shade outside making observations was difficult on account of the wind i did not like to shelter myself behind the tent while making them for fear of arousing the inevitable curiosity and suspicion the wind dropped in the evening and we were repaid for a hot and scorching day by a beautifully cool evening with a fine moon there was dancing and singing by bukhara and the other men until midnight friday april twenty seventh our canoe was the first of the two lost oases which it is my good fortune to place definitely on the map there had long been a tradition that two oases existed close to the southwestern corner of egypt but the position that they had been conjecturally given on one or two maps was from thirty to one hundred and eighty kilometers out of place no one had described them from an actual visit my observation showed that our canoe is situated in north latitude twenty degrees twelve minutes thirty two seconds and east longitude twenty four degrees forty four minutes fifteen seconds and has an altitude of five hundred ninety eight meters at the foot of the mountain it is thus well within the boundaries of egypt the principal interest of this oasis as at Uenat, lies in the possibility it offers for exploring the southwest corner of egypt which has until now been unreached either by military patrols or by travelers no one is known with any certainty of water supplies in that part of the desert which could be relied upon the water at our canoe is apparently unfailing and is drinkable though not as wholesome for human beings as one could wish our canoe may conceivably prove to have strategic value at some future time standing as it does almost precisely at the meeting point of the western and southern boundaries of egypt both our canoe and uanat differ from all the other oases of the western desert of egypt in that they are not depressions in the desert with underground water supplies but mountain areas where rainwater collects in natural basins in the rocks. The mountain chain of Arkanu, as I saw it, is about 15 kilometers in extent from north to south and some 20 kilometers from east to west, but there was no opportunity to explore it to the eastward so that I cannot say whether it may not extend farther in that direction than I have stated. I could only observe it as far as I could see from the desert at the western foot of the mountains it may well be that off to the east arkanu mountain runs into a chain of hills of which the uanat mountains are also spurs to the south there is an opportunity for more explorations of the eastern portions of both these rock masses than i was able to make in the time and with the resources at my command the nearest known point to arkanu and uanat to the east or rather the northeast is dakla oasis some six hundred kilometers distant there is a tradition that there is an old track to egypt between these two points but a journey from dakla to arkanu and uanat with caravan which would take at least fourteen days would be a formidable undertaking end of section fifteen chapter seventeen the lost oases uanat saturday april twenty eighth we started at 9.30 p.m. for the first all-night trek, 
halting at 7 a.m. on the 29th. We made 40 kilometers. It was fair and clear with a very strong hot wind from the southeast all day. The wind blew from the same quarter but was warm rather than hot all night. The ground was serira, with large stones making bad going for the camels. At 6 a.m. we reached the western corner of Weenot Mountain and camped an hour later. The day was spent quietly, chiefly in rest for the coming night trek. In the early evening we sent men to bring the camels from their grazing. Bukhara hired a camel from a tibu to relieve his own, which he wanted to be able to sell at the end of the journey for a high price. I hired three tibus and their camels to go with us, but not for the same reason. Our transport was inadequate, for the trek from Kufra had shown me that our loads were too heavy. The camels became quickly exhausted. The camels were brought in at eight in the evening, and we started an hour and a half later. They were lightly loaded this time because we were taking no water from our canoe. The water there, while its taste is not particularly unpleasant, is hard on one's digestive apparatus. We had three bad cases of dysentery among the men. The invalids rode camels from the start, and the rest of the men took turns during the night. The caravan started out in the best of humor. At intervals, some cheerful spirit stopped and began to chant. In a moment, half a dozen of them were lined up beside him, all chanting, stamping, and clapping their hands rhythmically as the camels filed past. The words of the song were always the same. En Khan Aziz Alaya Lanzar, Hata Lao Bayad Bidar. The accents are strongly pronounced and differ in the two lines, as I have marked them. I would translate the verse thus without making any attempt to fit it to the jazz rhythm that would be needed to complete the effect for the western ear. O oh, beloved, our eyes gaze after you, even though your camp is far away. Again and again the chant was repeated until the performance ended in a sudden shout. I had been the whole audience for the little show, beating the rhythm with my whip, and when the shout went up I called out, Faragahu Barud, empty gunpowder, was the signal for a fait de joie from the rifles, after which we all took our places in the caravan and went on exhilarated. A night march has its advantages. The time, unless one is dead tired, passes more quickly than during the day, and the stars are cheering company for any lover of nature. On the horizon ahead of us loomed the dark masses of Uinat Mountains. It is so much easier to march with one's destination distinct before one than to be walking on the flat disk of a desert where every point of the compass looks like every other, and the horizon keeps always at the same maddening distance. We steadily approached the mountains until the sun was rising over them, tinting and gilding their peaks and throwing out on the desert a heavy shadow whose edge marked steadily toward the mountain foot as we approached it from another direction. Shortly after sunrise, we were opposite the northwest corner of the mountains, and an hour later we made camp close under their rocky walls. At this point, there was an indentation in the mountainside with a well and a cave at its inner end. We pitched our tents at the mouth of this little arm of the desert sea, and ten minutes later we were all sunk into sleep. This was our first full night of travel, and we had some arrears of sleep to make up. However, we did not sleep as long as we had expected to, but roused ourselves before noon and turned our attention to food. The French saying Kidradin may be true under some conditions, but we of the desert find it more satisfactory when we are able to do both. We all found pleasant distraction in roasting parts of the lamb which was provided by Mohammed as diafa for Uinat. I spent the rest of the day in visiting the well, which is situated in the cave in the mountainside, in taking observations, and in looking over our surroundings. At this point, the mountain rises in a sheer cliff, with a mass of boulders, great and small, heaped against it at its foot. The stones that make up this tabra, as the geologists call it, have been carved by ages of wind and driven sand into smooth, rounded shapes that giants of the heroic days might have used in their slings to kill monsters or for some enormous game of bowls. The Ain, or well, lies a few meters away from the camp, 
in a cavity walled and roofed with great rocks. It is a pool of refreshing water, kept cool by their protection from the sun. The desert knows two kinds of wells, the Ain, which, properly speaking, is a spring, and the Bir or Matan, which is a place where water may be obtained by digging in the sand. We call these wells of Uanat Ains, for lack of a better word, although they are not springs, but reservoirs in the rock where rainwater collects. There are said to be seven of these Ains in the Uanat Mountains, of which I was to see four before I moved south again. I also heard rumors of one or two beers in the oasis, but I did not see them. In the evening the camp was full of life and gaiety. The men danced and sang as though there were no tedious days of hot sand and scorching wind behind or ahead of them. Monday, April 30th. Up early and went with Zerwali, Abdullahi, Muhammad, and Malkini, the Tibu, to the Big Ain up the mountain. It was a stiff climb of an hour and a half. The Ain has a plentiful supply of splendid water and is picturesquely surrounded with tall, slim reeds. I took some of the reeds back with me to make pipe stems. They give a pleasantly cool smoke. In the early evening, I set out on the Hajan with Malkini, Sanusi Buhasan, and Saad to explore the oasis. It was a fine moonlit night with a warm southeast breeze. For four hours, we marched over Sarira, skirting the northwest corner of the mountain, and at midnight, we entered a valley with a chain of low hills on our left and the sinister mountain with its fantastic rock formations on our right. The valley is floored with soft sand strewn with big stones, which made hard going for the camels. At the hour when men's spirits and courage are proverbially at the lowest ebb, we halted a few minutes for a draft of strong tea from my thermos flask, and then pushed on. But our spirits were by no means low. There was something magical about the night and the moonlight and the mountains to make this experience stirring to the imagination and uplifting to the soul. I speak for myself, but the men seem to be getting something out of it, too. At five, the valley opened out onto a wide plain of flat Sarira, with hills ten or fifteen kilometers away to the northeast. We turned sharply to the south, around a spur of the mountain. At dawn, we stopped for morning prayers. The camels were barracked, and we took our stand on the sands facing toward Mecca. When Moslems take part in their ceremonial prayers, they stand before God, not, as some misinformed persons say, before Muhammad, who was not God but a man, a prophet, and not the deity. And the first essential is cleansing of body, heart, and soul. In the desert, the cleansing of the body can be only symbolical, since water cannot be spared. We take sand in our hands, rub it over each hand and forearm, and then gently over our faces. With hands uplifted, palms upward, we say the prayers appointed, then, kneeling, touch our foreheads to the cool sands of the morning. In the desert, prayers are no mere blind obedience to religious dogma, but an instinctive expression of one's inmost self. The prayers at night bring serenity and peace. At dawn, when new life has suddenly taken possession of the body, one eagerly turns to the Creator to offer humble homage for all the beauty of the world and of life and to seek guidance for the coming day. One prays, then, not because one ought, but because one must. Seven o'clock found us entering a wide valley, running a little east of south, with mountains rising high on both sides. The floor of the valley is as flat as a table, patterned with tufts of grass and marked here and there with mimosa trees and small shrubs whose leaves, when crushed, give off a fragrance similar to that of mint. At intervals, the ground is carpeted with creeping plants of the colocynth, expanses of green leaves dotted with brilliant yellow globes like grapefruit. It is from this fruit that the Tibus and Goran make abra. They boil the pips thoroughly to get rid of their bitter taste, and then crush them with dates or locusts in a wooden mortar. Abra is their staple dish. For three hours we proceeded up the valley, and at ten we camped, hot and tired, but not ill-content. We ate a good meal of rice, drank our three glasses of tea, and went to sleep in the shade of a ridge. 
It was uncomfortable slumber, what with swarming flies and the moving shadow of the ridge, which made each of us shift position from time to time. As I opened my eyes, a figure stood near me that seemed to be part of a pleasant dream. She was a beautiful girl of the Goran, the slim, graceful lines of whose body were not spoiled by the primitive garments she wore. She carried a bowl of milk, which she offered with shy dignity. I could only accept it and drink gratefully. Then she asked me for medicine for her sister, who had borne no children. When she refused to believe that I had no medicine that would be helpful to her sister, I fell back on my malted milk tablets, a harmless remedy for ailments which were beyond me. I also gave her a midgety and a silk handkerchief for herself. A tibu appeared with a parcel of meat of the wadam or wild sheep. I gave him macaroni and rice, and he went away happy. After we had eaten, I went to see some relics of the presence of men in earlier times. At our canoe, I had got to talking with one of the Gorans, and having satisfied myself about the present inhabitants of Uanat, I asked him whether he knew anything about any former inhabitants of the oasis. He gave me a startling answer. Many different people have lived round these wells as far back as anyone could remember. Even jinn have dwelt in that place in olden days. Jin, I exclaimed, how do you know that? Have they not left their drawings on the rocks, he answered. With suppressed excitement, I asked him where. He replied that in the valley of Uanat there were many drawings upon the rocks, but I could not induce him to describe them further than saying that there were writings and drawings of all the animals living, and nobody knows what sort of pens they used, for they wrote very deeply on the stones, and time has not been able to efface the writings. Doing my best not to show anything like excitement, I inquired whether he could tell me just where the drawings were. At the end of the valley, where the tail of the valley wags, he answered. The whole time I remembered this, and after a little time spent in making sure about the water, which is the most important thing, and having a look around from the top of the hills at the surrounding country, there came the exciting task of going round the oasis. But the most exciting part of it was to find these rock inscriptions, especially as the history that I had been able to collect about the oasis was very scanty. I gathered that Uanat was the pé de terre of Tebus and Goran, who were going eastward to attack and to spoil the Kababishi. Our canoe and Uanat, indeed, were very well placed for that purpose, since they provided water for the attacking party, and at the same time were too far away for the Kababishi to dare to attempt reprisals or try to recover their own belongings. With these drawings in mind, then, I took Malkenny, who had joined the caravan at Arkanu, and toward sunset he led me straight to them. They were in a valley at the part where it drew in, curving slightly with a suggestion of a wagging tail. We found them on the rock at the ground level. I was told there were other similar inscriptions at a half a day's journey, but as it was growing late and I did not want to excite suspicion, I did not go to them. There was nothing beyond the drawings of animals, no inscriptions. It seemed to me as though they were drawn by somebody who was trying to compose a scene. Although primitive in character, they betrayed an artistic hand. The man who drew these outlined figures of animals had a decorative sense. On their wall of rock, these pictures were rudely but not unskillfully carved. There were lions, giraffes, and ostriches, all kinds of gazelles, and perhaps cows, though many of these figures were effaced by time. The carving is from a quarter to a half an inch in depth, and the edges of the lines are weathered until in some parts they can be scraped off easily with a finger. I asked who made the pictures, and the only answer I got came from Malkenny, the Tibu, who declared his belief that they were the work of the jinn. What man, he demanded, can do these things now? I did not find any traditions about the origin of these interesting rock markings, but I was struck by two things. There are no giraffes in this part of the country now, nor do they live in any similar desert country anywhere. Also, there are no camels among the carvings on the rocks, and one cannot penetrate to this oasis now except with camels. Did the men who made these pictures know the giraffe and not the camel? 
I reflected that the camel came to Africa from Asia some 500 years B.C. At 5.30, we started for the home camp. We wound our way up a steep mountain path, hardly wide enough in places for a single man, and exceedingly dangerous going for the camels. We reached the highest point of the path, and then picked our way down to the desert level south of the mountains. At the highest point we reached, there were a few peaks around, some two or three hundred meters higher than we were. The camels went up and down the steep path wonderfully well in spite of the darkness, and at 10.30 we were at the foot of the mountains. It seemed best to give the camels a rest, and we halted at eleven for two hours. We had tea, and a Tibu family whose camp was near came to visit us. We snatched a brief sleep and awoke refreshed. There was a cool wind blowing, and the ride home over the level desert was a pleasant relief after the hot work of climbing about among the rocks. We reached camp at ten a.m. of the second and were met with firing of rifles and an agreeable welcome. Wednesday, May 2nd. On reaching camp, we found Sheik Harry, the Goran chief who is called King of Uinat, and its 150 inhabitants. He came the day before to visit me and waited for my return. He was a very nice old man with a calm, dignified face. He brought two sheep, milk, and abra for diafa. He was keeping Ramadan, and I insisted on his staying the night with us. Otherwise, it could not offer him hospitality, since he might not eat or drink until sunset. I had a long talk with him and with Mohammed. The old chief was still fond of his own country north of Wadai and sighed when it was spoken of. He belonged to the Hezi family, which is a ruling family of Goran in northern Wadai. He came to Kufra as a voluntary exile when the French entered Wadai, and later he settled in Wadai. I found myself tired after our 28 hours of trekking with only 9 hours of rest, but a bath, a meal, and a short sleep made life worth living again in the evening. Bukhara had organized a chorus among the men, and the evening was spent with Bedouin, Tibu, and Sudanese songs. Thursday, May 3rd. Harry came to my tent with a bowl of milk when I got up. When I thanked him, he shook his head sadly. This is all I have to offer, he said. It is not worthy of you, but you will forgive us for not being able to give you the hospitality that you should have. I assured him that it is the spirit that counts in these matters and not the intrinsic value of the offerings. The day was spent in preparation for the start south, which I hoped would be made on the morrow. Friday, May 4th. I made an arrangement with Harry to go with us to Erdi as an additional guide. Mohammed had not been through this country for a number of years, and I felt that Harry should know it better. In the afternoon, I went for a long walk and took photographs of the mountains. By this time, all the Tibu and Goran settlements, which are scattered about the oasis wherever there is grazing for their beasts, had heard of our presence, and the people came to visit us. There were many guests for dinner, and it was a very gay camp. It was one of the pleasantest evenings of the trip. Before we leave Uanat, I must say something about Bukhara, who is one of the most interesting people in the caravan and a romantic figure. He is tall, slim, and wiry, a typical Bedouin, always cheerful and with a song at his lips at those critical moments in the day, early in the morning or late at night, when the men are tired with a night march and need encouragement. I did not know that he smoked until one day, as I was saddling my horse, I caught him collecting the cigarette ends from the spot where my tent had stood. After this, I shared my cigarettes with him. It was great fun to hand him a packet of the precious articles and see him break into a song and dance for joy. Bukhara is one of the most traveled Bedouins that I have come across. He is only 33, and yet he has traveled to Wadai, Borku, Bornu, and Darfur. He has seen days of good fortune in the past, but today he owns but one camel. He has thrown in his lot with my caravan, arranging with Bu Halega that he is to have a share of the money received for the latter's camels when they are sold at the end of the journey. He speaks most of the dialects of the black tribes and knows a great deal about them. He is also a wonderful mimic. One evening he put on the green cloth that formed a partition in my tent as a burnous, 
and with sad and Hamid bleeding like sheep behind him, came to camp pretending to be a Bedouin sheik, bringing the two sheep as Diafa. We were kept in roars of laughter, and suddenly Bukhara flung away the green cloth and, snatching a spear from one of the Tibus, broke into a Tibu war dance. A Tibu assisted him by beating a rhythm on one of the small, empty fantasses. This droll exhibition was followed by a concert of Bedouin songs from Cyrenaica, Fezzan, and Tripoli. I have seen Bukhar refuse to mount a camel to ride when all the Bedouins have yielded to temptation. Why don't you ride, Bukhar? I asked. There are several unloaded camels. What would my Washoon wife say if she heard that her Bukhara had ridden between Arkanu and Unat? He replied with scorn in his voice for the thought. He told me that on one occasion he had been entrusted with some fifty camels to take to Uanat for grazing. He was alone and ran short of food. For twelve days I ate no meal except the pits of colocynth, which upset my digestion, he replied simply. Then I reached Kufra. The men at Kufra who had sent me for the camels had forgotten to send me food. They had expected me at Kufra earlier. But why didn't you slaughter a camel? I inquired. Should I permit the men of Kufra to say that Bukhara could not endure hunger and kill the camel? He retorted proudly. Bukhara is very fond of his wife. When we reached Darkanu, he said to me, I am feeling better now, but I cried like a child when I said goodbye to my washoon at Kufra. It is always like that when I begin my journeys. If the company is good, I forget more quickly. End of section 16「Chapter eighteen Night Marches to Erdi Sunday, May sixth, we got away at six forty five PM and made a good twelve hours trek of fifty four kilometers. It was a thoroughly tiring performance, however, as the first night's march was likely to be. The men had had no chance to sleep during the day, but on the contrary had been busier than usual. In spite of our weariness, the loads had to be carefully watched and readjusted every now and then. At dawn, most of the men dropped back for short naps. One of the camels broke away and ran back toward Uanat. Malkenny had to leave the caravan at midnight and go after it. There was moonlight the latter half of the night and a refreshing cool breeze at three in the morning. The camels grazed as they went on the grass which grew here because of the water coming down from the hills. When we came to make camp, one of our best gerbas was found torn and half empty. It was a misfortune, for we could not spare water on the trek that was before us. We had to go ten days before reaching a well. Malkenny and the runaway camel did not appear during the day. My diary runs... Monday, May 7th, cloudy all day, strong northeast wind, which drops in the afternoon. Highest temperature, 38 degrees. When traveling at night, cannot take minimum temperature, which occurs about 2 or 3, as we are on the move at that time. Start at 6.30 p.m., halt at 11.30 p.m., make 20 kilometers, very soft sand, undulating with dry sabat for grazing. In the afternoon, a Tibu arrived with a camel loaded with the luggage that had been on the runaway. He told us that Malkenny's camel had thrown off its load and run back to the grazing ground at Uanat, with Malkenny after him. At 11.30, we halted on very soft sand with patches of rock about and grazing ground near Barit Shezu to wait for the runaways. They appeared shortly after our arrival, but I decided not to go farther that night. The rest would do us all good. Tuesday, May 8th, we started at 4.45 p.m. in an oppressive atmosphere under heavy clouds. Two hours later, it rained a little, and the Bedouins, whose life depends on rain, instinctively shouted with joy and sang fervently to the camels. The ground was undulating, hard, and covered with stones and large gravel. We crossed some small girds soon after starting, and then the country flattened out again with softer sand. 
at three thirty a m we entered a belt of high sand dunes and crossed it in an hour and a half after the dunes the ground became the old familiar cerebra again here i found bits of ostrich shells early in the day arami malkenny's brother had taken a sack and gone to collect hatab his name tells his story for among the tibus and goran a man who has killed another is known frankly as arami he had said that he would meet us later on we had no anxiety about him especially as we were told that he knew the way well but when we had been two hours on the road and it was growing dark we became anxious and halted to wait for him we fired many shots to attract his attention and direct him to where we were the men shouted his name as loud as they could but all in vain i turned to mal kenny and asked him what he intended to do my brother is mad he said no one asked him to collect hatab he left the camp without even having his breakfast it may be that he has been called by god to his death when the moon rises i shall leave my camel's load and return to look for him if he is alive i shall bring him back with me if he is dead i shall bury him and join you later it was said quite simply and as though it were all a matter of course the load was shifted from malkenny's camel to another and he set out on the back track arami had already had many narrow escapes from death and every one hoped that it might be so this time but mohammed was doubtful god is merciful he said but i think arami has walked to his fate i was afraid he might be right there was something strange about arami from the first i learned that on a trek once from erdi to uanat his water supply had run out and he had had a bad thirst as the desert people call it he had reached uanat half dead such an experience leaves its mark on a man and it is likely to be long before he is himself again i had noticed the queer strained vague look in his eyes and wondered about it if he did not come back the desert and one of its moods of cruelty would have claimed its own in the desert upon the long waterless treks the men from exhaustion thirst fatigue sleeplessness often lose their heads and as the bedouins say walk to their fate which means that unless their comrades are on the lookout and keep them with the caravan they walk away into the desert disregarding even the animal instinct of the camel to keep with the herd in such a case if the wanderer suddenly returns to his senses he has to sit down where he finds himself and not move it is understood that his comrades when they are aware of his absence will retrace his tracks of the caravan and then his own tracks upon the sand and so rescue him i met a bedouin at kufra who had been lost for eighteen hours cut off from the caravan when he was rescued he was unconscious suffering badly from thirst god was merciful he told me for i was just able to do my prayers and face god before what i thought was my inevitable death but we live and die only by the decree of god he added with a smile wednesday may ninth start at four fifteen p m halt at ten fifteen p m make twenty four kilometers highest temperature thirty seven degrees white clouds and very strong warm winds from the northeast which continues all day and at night develops into a sandstorm a few drops of rain fall at seven p m the sandstorm lasts from eight to ten the ground is ordinary cerebra with soft sand in places there are no landmarks and no dry grass we sight distant sand dunes on our right in the early morning we marched fourteen and a half hours last night but we were not very tired breakfast and four hours sleep found us all refreshed again mohammed wanted us to make an early start as there was a difficult gird ahead which could not be crossed in the dark so four fifteen found us under way with the sarira under our feet and a cool northeast wind behind us shortly after eight i felt the wind in my face i was startled for the wind does not usually shift so suddenly besides the quality of the wind had not changed the wind in our faces should be coming from the south and yet it is not warm 
there is something strange about it. I look above for the stars, but the sky is completely covered with dark clouds. I take out my compass and am startled to find that we are heading full northeast instead of southwest. Then it is clear to me that Mohammed has lost his head, as the Bedouins say, and is leading us in the diametrically opposite direction from the right one. It was a serious moment, and one that required tact and careful handling. It is dangerous to undermine a desert guide's confidence, and I got off my camel and, mounting my horse, Gallop to where Mohammed is leading the caravan. I realized as I went that the men of the caravan, most of whom were accustomed to this sort of country in this kind of weather, had also a feeling that we were going wrong. But it is the etiquette of the desert that no one may interfere with the guide in any way. The guide of a caravan is exactly like the captain of a ship. He is absolute master of the caravan so far as direction is concerned and must also be consulted as to the starting and halting times. I had, fortunately, asked Mohammed before leaving Unat as to the direction we were to take, and had set my compass to it. As I approach the guide, I find him agitated and lacking his habitual cheerful smile and air of self-reliance. I show him the compass and suggest that we are going in the wrong direction. He says nothing but scans the sky anxiously for his favorite jotty, but in vain for Polaris is behind the clouds. At this moment, the sandstorm, which had been rising, blew out his lantern. The caravan had caught up with us, and everyone realized that we had lost our way. Men and camels were huddled together with the gale and hurtling sand beating upon them. The wind made it impossible to hear one's own voice to say nothing of any other man's. Mohammed's confidence had completely deserted him, and I could see its effect on the men's faces. They were all traveled men of the desert, and they know what it meant to lose one's way in a serira where there are no landmarks. We must camp until the sky clears, is the chorus. But I know how fatal such a policy would be. They would spend four or five hours brooding over their fate and growing more and more despondent and hopeless. There is no need for a halt, as my compass is a reliable one, and I have checked it many times with the directions pointed out by Mohammed. This wind comes from the north, I asserted quietly, but with assurance during a lull in the storm, as it has for the past few days. If it came from the south, it would be hot. There is the Jadai, and this is our route. I pointed to where Polaris must be, unless the compass was all wrong, and then swung around and indicated the way that we should go. Allah bless you, replied Mohammed, pulling himself together. What you say is true. Sunusi Bu Hassan, who was our guide to Kufra, came close to me and in a loud voice confirmed the statement. Wallahi, you speak the truth, he said firmly. I had thought of it, but could not speak as I had no proof, since the Jadi hides himself behind the clouds. That was enough for us. We lighted the lantern with difficulty, and with Mohammed and Bu Hassan beside me, I led the way. How are we going to march? demands a voice from the darkness. Let the wind fan the back of your black neck, and you won't go much wrong, answers Bukhara with a laugh. A few hours later, Mohammed grips my hand, and pointing to the sand dunes ahead, ejaculates with deep feeling, The girds, praise be to God, God is generous. He is perfectly cheerful again. The storm soon subsided completely, and we were among the sand dunes. The sky was perfectly clear now, and even the most pessimistic of the men could have no more anxiety. But our little experience in this sandstorm demonstrated what a touch-and-go business desert trekking could be at times. It was only my compass that saved us from a very serious situation. Mohammed was doubtful of the wisdom of trying to cross the girds in the darkness, so we made our camp where we were. Thursday, May 10th. Start at 4.15 a.m., halt at 8.45 a.m., start again at 4.30 p.m., halt at 7 a.m. of the 11th. Make 75 kilometers, fine and clear. Strong cold wind in the early morning, moderating later. Highest temperature, 38 degrees 
sand dunes two kilometers in width of very soft sand dangerous in places then ordinary cerebra at five thirty p m country is interspersed with patches of black and white stone like that before reaching kufra at eight a m on the eleventh inter zone of dry grass on flat soft sands at four thirty a m pass belt of sand dunes in the early morning we got under way to cross the girds and speedily realized how serious a mistake it would have been to tackle them in the darkness they were very steep and the sand was treacherously soft the camels sank to their knees and had to be helped by the men it took us three-quarters of an hour to cross them we halted at nine a m very hungry for we had not eaten since lunch the day before we needed food more than sleep since the few hours of rest during the night were quite refreshing it was still hot when we started again at four thirty p m but a pleasant northeast breeze tempered the oppressiveness harry asked me for a few yards of white cloth to make a turban because the heat of the sun was affecting his head i was glad to give it to him among the tibus and goran only sheiks wear white i felt like walking that night and rode my camel less than usual since leaving Onat, I had been walking six or seven hours a night, but that night I did nine. We made good progress until 3 a.m., when I suddenly felt or heard something rustle against my ankle boot. I reached down and found grass. The desert had changed its aspect. The camels were hungry, for we set out from Onat with only two days' food for them, trusting to the opportunities for grazing that we expected to find so we let them eat as they went along instead of driving them at their best pace that night's march was tiring for everybody we had arrears of sleep to make up and keeping the camels going in grazing country was hard work mohammed and harry both rode most of the way with hassan carrying the lantern just before dawn however mohammed got down and relieved him when we rounded up the camels for our morning prayers the men looked more weary than I had ever seen them. Friday, May 11th. Start at 4.45 p.m. Halt at 3.15 a.m. of the 12th. Make 42 kilometers. Clear and fine. No wind. Warm all day and night. Highest temperature 39 degrees. Soft sand covered with dry tufts of grass like a field of ripe corn. At 12.45 a.m., pass an ordinary gird. At 1, enter the flat Sarira without grass. At 3.15, halt at Sandstone Hills, having missed our way. The day was spent in sleeping and eating, and at 4.45 p.m., we started with the intention of marching all night. But by 10, everybody was tired and sleepy. Even Mohammed was riding his camel. In the next few hours, he fell asleep at intervals, and because of his fatigue did not look back to correct his direction by Polaris. When a guide neglects the jadi, he is far gone indeed. Sanusi Buasan and I felt certain that he was not taking the right course, but did not want to interfere with him again after the previous night. At 3.15 a.m. we came to a ridge of hills, and Mohammed stopped dead. Until now, I had been walking behind the caravan and checking from time to time the bearing on which we were going. We had been walking since 10 o'clock, more to the southward than before. When the caravan halted, I rode forward to Muhammad and asked why we were stopping. This opening in the hills, he says, pointing in front of him, I do not recognize it, and I do not know what kind of ground follows it. Whatever is false, he is perfectly frank. I did not want to arouse any feeling of anxiety in the men, and so I said casually, Let us camp until daybreak. We are all tired tonight. I have hardly spoken the words when the camels are barracked and their loads are on the ground. I have never seen men fall so quickly to sleep. Each one wraps himself swiftly in his jurd and takes shelter from the cold northeast wind behind a piece of luggage. Mohammed goes up to the ridge to look about him, and I follow. I think you have been following the jaddy too much, I suggest, meaning that he has been going too directly to the south. I do not intimate that he has been asleep on his camel. 
I do not want to shake his self-confidence and have him become demoralized. Allah bless you, he murmurs, scanning the horizon anxiously. I must have done so, for we should not have reached hills so early. I counted on getting to them at dawn. But in the morning God will bring solace. I am somewhat troubled as I leave him and lie awake a few minutes, hoping that we have not gone far from our proper path but I am too tired to worry long and quickly go to sleep. Saturday, May 12th. At 4.30 a.m., Mohammed's voice is heard, To prayers, O ye Moslems! We quickly get up and are underway in an hour. Mohammed puts himself at the head of the caravan, and I join him. He is still troubled, but as we round a corner of the hills, he sighs with the relief. Allah be praised, there lies our way. He points to the northwest corner of the chain of hills, and we make for it. We reach it at 9.45 a.m. and pitch camp. The camels are sent a kilometer or two into the hills to graze. Men and camels are in bad shape, and the water is getting scarce. In the afternoon, Muhammad and Harry go ahead into the hills to make a track in the sand with a tent pole for us to follow. At 5 p.m., we follow them into the sand dunes and thence into the hills. The girds are fortunately not many, though they are steep enough, but it is the hilly country beyond them that takes it out of us. Our feet keep bumping into stones in the dark, and Bedouin shoes are little protection against such painful encounters. The collisions are particularly numerous and correspondingly trying in the early morning hours when we are terribly sleepy and walk with eyes half shut. On previous nights, I have tried the experiment of suddenly firing two or three shots from my rifle to rouse the men to life, and with good results. Each time they have responded with a loud cheer and mended their pace forthwith. But tonight the scheme fails. About three in the morning, the most deadly hour of all, I empty gunpowder, but not a voice responds. There is one small compensation, however, in the midst of this dead expanse of fatigue and depression. The crescent moon rises in the early morning, a curved silver thread with a brilliant star above it, an exquisite piece of celestial jewelry. I fix my eyes on their beauty and forget for a moment the bruises that my poor feet are getting. When, a little later, we reach a patch of dry grass, we are all ready to let the camels graze for a while and to give our tired bodies a brief respite. At dawn, we halt again for morning prayers. We have barely risen from our knees when most of the men wrap themselves in their jerds and fall on the beautiful red sand like white stones. The caravan goes limping on, and the sleepers join us presently, I hope a little refreshed. My limbs ache this morning and cannot be made comfortable. I try every possible position on my camel, in every possible pace and stride and walking, but none of them are of any avail. My eyelids, too, seem weighted with lead. At six, we have the good fortune to come across a few patches of green grass and make camp, having marched for thirteen tormented hours. Eyes are bloodshot and bodies are protesting in every muscle and sinew. In a half hour, it is a dead camp. Sunday, May 13th. We were up at 10 a.m. for breakfast. The men went to sleep again, but I could not. We started again at 5.15 p.m., and this evening things were worse than ever. The country had become more undulating and broken, and both camels and men found the going disastrously painful. Camels were continually being left behind as we wound about among the dunes and little hills of rock. They found bits of grass and fell to grazing. It was very difficult to see them against the red sand spotted with patches of dark stone. The singing stopped early that night, the surest sign that the men were dead tired. Zerwali told me that Mohammed had come to him to say that we had better camp early and not try to march too long tonight. The going was so difficult, and we changed direction so often to go around the elevated points and stone outcroppings that there was a danger of losing our way. But Sir Wally, knowing how averse I am of any delay, had told the guide that I wanted to make a night's march of it. 
at last the walking was so hard and camels were so continually left behind that i felt that there was no use in going farther if i had needed any more proof that the men were spent it would have been supplied by the fact that hassan the wajangi ordinarily a sturdy walker had taken to a camel early in the evening and had not come off it we camped at eleven thirty p m i wrapped myself in my jurd and told the men not to bother about making a shelter for me i am sure i did not move from the first position i dropped into until five i got up with a stiff back and aching legs the morning air was serene and refreshing and the sight of the men busy and eager to go ahead made me forget my physical discomforts in spite of the new spirit of cheerfulness which the morning brought however things were not too encouraging for us the country was nearly as bad for trekking as it could be the men seemed to be losing confidence in mohammed and harry the camels were in bad condition and our water was very low monday may fourteenth start at six a m halt at nine a m start again at five thirty p m halt at ten p m make thirty kilometers fair and clear cool northeast breeze at seven a m which drops at midday calm evening and night highest temperature thirty two degrees soft sand covered with grass both green and dry shortly after start in afternoon country changes into undulating ground with valleys full of green grass and dry nisha this is one of the signs that we are approaching erdi at six thirty p m hilly again for about four kilometers and then we pass a big valley with grazing and trees as we started again in the morning i intended to go forward for four or five hours but it speedily got too hot and we camped at nine the four hours rest had its good effect and no one went to sleep until we had had breakfast in the afternoon mohammed and harry went ahead again to mark the way as there was even more difficult going before us the caravan got under way at five thirty p m our water had become scarce and bad and the camels looked weak and exhausted we were anxious to reach Erdi as soon as possible. Shortly after the start, Bukhara and Arami, not the one who went away into the desert and disappeared, but another who had also killed his man, found the track of big warren or lizard, and we followed it to its hole. A little sport was a pleasant relief. We dug into the hole, but the lizard was not at home. We traced its track to a pile of rocks, and after twenty minutes of excavation, caught the creature the bedouins and blacks use the fat of the warren as a medicine for rheumatism and say that if one carries its head about with him he is safe against black magic its skin hung in a house is reputed to keep snakes at a distance the warren does not bite but it has a tail like a whip with which it can do damage arami skinned the creature for me we followed the track made by our guides but lost it many times in the dark and wasted time finding it again at last it began to wobble about and i realized that mohammed was by no means certain of his direction i ordered the men to camp and fired shots into the air shortly we were joined by mohammed and harry who were relieved that i had decided to halt the guide told me that he could not be sure of his road in this country in the darkness but that he knew we were not far from the well. For the first time since leaving Uanat, we had five solid hours of undisturbed sleep. Before going to bed, I talked to Arami about Erdi and its wells. Mohammed is a good guide by daylight, he said, but he is old, and at night he does not see much. Besides, he has not been to this country for several years. We should have camped at the first well this evening, but we have missed it. But God knows best. I told him to say nothing of this to the men, lest they should grow more panicky and blame Mohammed. I prepared my sleeping bag and sat down to think. This was the most discouraging moment of the journey. The men had lost confidence and had suffered much from the heat. The camels were dead beat, largely from the same cause. 
The guide was not sure of the way, and the water was scarce and bad. Any one of these circumstances would have been enough to make one anxious, but altogether made a devastating assault upon one's nerve. As I reviewed the difficulties and dangers of the trip thus far, there flashed through my mind the thought that neither the mad Narami nor his brother Malkenny, who went to find him, had been seen again. I found myself wondering whether fate intended to rob me of what I had been able to achieve. If fate is malicious, this was an opportune moment to strike. If I had missed Arkanu and Uanat, it would not have been so hard. But now that I had made my modest achievement, I felt I should like to get back home with it but God knows best. I wondered if it would be a sleepless night, but the magic of the desert came again into play, and I was surprised to find my eyelids growing heavier. The sleep that came was sweet. Tuesday, May 15th. We were up at four. Still uncertain where we were, Harry, Mohammed, and I went forward to make a reconnaissance, when suddenly the red hills of Erdi leaped into view. I satisfied myself by a good look through my binocular that we were not mistaken, and an hour later we started toward them. Before we started, there was a discussion as to whether we should camp on the hills above the valley in which the well lies, or go down into it. The descent would be hard on the camels, but nevertheless we decided to make it and camp on the floor of the wadi. In case of an attack by marauders, we should at least have possession of the water supply. We had been steadily climbing through rough defiles between cliffs of red rock, and suddenly we came out on top of a high cliff with a pleasant wadi of Erdi lying stretched out below us. It is a narrow valley, about 10 kilometers long by not more than 100 meters wide, surrounded by sheer cliffs of red rock. Trees and green grass, after the monotonous serira and the bare unfriendly rocks that we have been traversing since Uanat, suggest all the traditional connotations of the phrase, an oasis in the desert. As we approached the well, Muhammad and Harry went forward again to reconnoiter the ground. The blacks are always cautious when they come to a well. They do not approach it directly, but send a man or two ahead to make sure that if anyone is already there, he is not a stranger or at least not an enemy. So the two guides will not only mark out the path we are to follow, but we'll discover if we need to be on our guard when approaching a well. We picked our way laboriously down the rough path into the valley and pitched camp at its northern end. The well lies at the extreme south, and there is no way of getting to it safely from above without great risk to the camels, except where we came down. A huge meal of rice and freshly baked bread, combined with our pleasant surroundings, made us all cheerful as a wedding party. My anxious thoughts of the previous night seemed now like an absurd nightmare, and yet there was plenty of truth in them. There is often, in the desert, only a hair's breadth between safety and comfort and disaster. After three glasses of stimulating tea, over which we all lingered luxuriously, the men went off to the well to water the camels and to bring back water for the camp. When they returned, a shave, a bath, and clean clothes restored all my self-respect and confidence, and life seemed very good again. At five in the afternoon, I climbed the wall of the valley with a the theodolite and took observations. Sir Wally went with Sanusibu Hassan and Arami on a hunt for Wadden, the mountain sheep, but they came back unsuccessful. I asked Arami if it were the fault of the sportsman. Wallahi, by God, no, they shoot straight, but God was merciful to the Wadden. Night fell on a camp of rested camels and cheerful singing men. I felt I should have none but pleasant dreams tonight. End of section 17「Chapter nineteen Entering the Sudan I got up early in order to open the film box and refill the cameras while it was still cool. At seven, with Mohammed and Hamad, I set out to visit the well. 
the valley of Erdi is what is known as a Karkur, a long, narrow depression in the hills which winds like a snake. It runs to the southward for seven or eight kilometers, ending in a cul-de-sac where the well lies in the shadowy hollow under the rocks. The pool is semicircular in shape, half a dozen meters long and half as broad. The well is like those at Uanat, although I suspect that in addition to the rainwater, it may possibly be fed by a spring. The approach to it is a rocky and somewhat dangerous climb. The night before, one of the camels bringing water slipped and hurt itself rather badly. We climbed up to the Ain, had a rest and tea, and rode home under a hot sun. The valley is beautiful, with its sheer walls of red rock and the green grass and trees scattered about below them. Mohammed told me that it is the most difficult valley in this region to enter, and therefore the easiest to defend. In the late afternoon I climbed the valley wall to watch the fine sunset and the play of the light upon the red sand and the rose-colored rocks. The men shaved their heads, trimmed their beards, and washed and mended their clothes, which were becoming very tattered. The grazing here just saved our camels, and it was wise to take this day for rest and recuperation. Mohammed and Harry told me that from now on it would not be practicable to travel at night. The country was too hilly to be safe to traverse in the darkness. All the Bedouins gave Mohammed credit for the way he led the camels over the steep rocks into the valley yesterday. In the evening, the dog had a fit of barking, and we suspected that someone was near. We quickly put out the fires, gathered the camels together, made ready the rifles, and put sentries out around the camp. But it was a false alarm. These precautions, like those we take when approaching a well, seem absurd when it is all over and nothing has happened. But in an unknown country like this, the caravan that did not take them would be very foolish. An attack by hostile tribesmen or outlaws is far from an improbability. Thursday, May 17th. We were up at 4 and underway at 5.30. The climb out of the valley was as difficult as the descent, and one camel fell, but fortunately without serious results. As we reached the edge of the wadi and looked back, I realized the difference between the valleys in these hills and those at our canoe in Uanat. There, the floor of a valley is on the same level as the plain outside, and one goes into it by a pass, as though through a gateway. In the region we were now in, the valleys are depressed below the general level of the country, and one drops down into them by winding rocky paths. In an hour we were out of the wadi and turned to the southeast. We were in a mountainous country of black and red rocks, and it was clear that we could not travel over such terrain in the dark. At 9.30 we descended into a large valley by a steep path on which two camels stumbled and threw off their loads. One, carrying water, very nearly broke its neck, but the presence of mind of Abdullahi, who drew a knife and cut the girths, saved the situation. The wooden stopper of one of the fantasses came out, and the water was three-quarters spilled. Fortunately, the next well was only three days ahead, and we had an ample supply for even a longer trek. Such an occurrence as this would have been a disaster if we had been in a daffa, as a long, waterless trek between wells is called. On this morning, a serious situation arose suddenly which might have had fatal results, had it not been for two pieces of luck. Ahmed, the cook, who came with me from Egypt, was riding a camel without a bridle. He had asked Hamid, the camel man of Buhalega, to provide a bridle, but the other, being wise in the ways of camels, knew better than to do so. It is important that the camels be able to graze at will. They are more in need of food than of guidance. Ahmed's camel, spying a fine tuft of grass, went directly to it. On the way, he passed under a tree set thickly with thorns. The rider could not escape the sharp projections, and his face was badly torn. Annoyed by the pain, Ahmed proceeded to curse the camel and the owner of the camels. Hamid instantly retaliated by cursing him and telling him not to curse the noble owner of the animals. I happened to be near, 
and in my heart I praised the camelman for his loyalty to Buhalega, his master. Ahmed came quickly off the camel, his face streaked with blood, and went hotly at Hamid. Sanusi Buhassan, the other Hamid, and Saad, the Ajuli, rushed to take the side of their brother Bedouin. Abdullahi ranged himself beside Ahmed, two Egyptians shoulder to shoulder. I had had experience of such quarrels before, and I quickly looked to see where the rifles were. It was with deep relief that I saw them safely fastened on the camel's backs. The men had only sticks to fight with, but even so prompt action was necessary before the trouble became more acute. I galloped my horse among the men and pushed him between the two groups of combatants, brusquely ordering Ahmed and Abdullahi to stand back. It was a most difficult moment, with one side of my own men and the other the men of my caravan. Sanusi Buasan and Hamid looked back, and for a flicker of a second I saw their eyes rest on the slung rifles. One word of encouragement from me to the other party would have meant disaster, for the Bedouins outnumbered us. On the other hand, it was not the time, even if my own men were in the wrong, to humiliate them before the Bedouins. "'What do you mean by behaving like children?' I demanded impartially of the men on both sides. "'Men like you ought to be ashamed.' Hamid started to speak. He insulted me. Ahmed interrupted him. He attacked me as I came off my camel. I don't care who insulted whom or who attacked whom, I declared sharply. You are all my men, and it is a shame to have you behave like a batch of children. Just then Zerwali came up. I turned to Abdullahi and then to Sanusi Buhassan. And you older men, instead of bringing peace, actually take part in this disgraceful quarrel? I said severely. Perhaps I made a mistake. I should have chosen men for my caravan and not boys. By this time both parties had begun to cool down and to lose their tense look of men about to spring to the attack. Zerwali, who probably expected me to take the side of my compatriots, Abdullahi and Ahmed, was disarmed and did the unexpected thing. Put Hamid on the ground, he ordered the slave Faraj. I will beat him with my whip. In a flash, the stalwart Faraj laid Hamid unceremoniously on the ground and pinned him there with his knee. Before I could interfere, Zerwali's whip descended twice. But by that time, I had dismounted and caught Zerwali's arm. This is no matter for punishment, I asserted. We don't know who is to blame. I shall inquire into the matter and punish with my own hands the man who has proved guilty. Turning to the men, I commanded, Follow the camels. To Mohammed and Harry, who had kept tactfully out of the affair, I gave the order, Lead the way, pointing with my stick. All moved off, and I walked alone, trying to preserve for their benefit my expression of stern disapproval. Sir Wally gradually edged nearer to me and spoke deprecatingly. The bay is not angry over what has happened, he questioned. God knows when I got up this morning there was something weighing heavy on my heart. I felt sure that something unpleasant was going to happen. My feeling was reflected in your salutation to me. I realized that I also had an uncanny feeling. There was no reason for it, for everything was going smoothly and well. But still, something had oppressed me. In a short while, both parties felt like children who had been naughty. I observed furtive glances stealing toward me from both sides to see if my anger was abated. But I kept my stern countenance until luncheon. Those who have traveled in the desert and know the Bedouins will realize what a serious possibility this incident contained. A single harsh word, interpreted as an insult, means shooting if guns are close at hand. If both men had had their rifles, and if I had been some hundred yards away, as was generally the case, there would almost certainly have been bloodshed. The Bedouins would probably have killed Ahmed and Abdullahi out of hand. Then what could I have done as an Egyptian but avenge the killing of my countrymen at whatever cost to myself? How lucky it was that the rifles were lashed to the camels and that I was close at hand. We are getting near the end of our journey, said Zerwali. The men are always quarrelsome then. 
By the time this dangerous incident was over, the sun was very hot, and we camped in the valley in the shade of some fine trees. The camels had good grazing while we ate and rested. Before we started in the afternoon, Mohammed, Sanusi Buhassan, Bukhara, and Hamid, the camel men, came to ask me to forgive Hamid for having let his anger get the better of him with Ahmed. I pardoned him readily, and he went to Ahmed and kissed his head. Ahmed returned the compliment, and then the quarrel was ended in the best Bedouin tradition. We made our way down the big valley for three hours and camped near its mouth at 7.15. Shortly before halting, we saw ahead of us the distant hills of Aga, where the next well lay. The ground before us was flat Sarira, and it was a relief to see it. On this morning, when we were going down into the valley, it looked as if all our baggage would be in bits if there were more of these precipices. In places, the descent was so rough that for the safety we had to unload the camels. The men had to carry the baggage down the steep rocks, often a drop of three feet from boulder to boulder. The new moon had risen as we camped. The next day was Bairam, a feast marking the end of Ramadan, and Zerwali came to say that the men would like to feast according to our Moslem custom. I willingly agreed, since the Aga hills were in sight before us, and the water supply was ample. Besides, the excellent grazing in this valley would do the camels good. We all rose early the next day, Friday, May 18th, and put on clean clothes for the feast day. We exchanged good wishes and followed them with the prayers appointed for Byram. There was a look on every face as of men who are thinking of those left behind at home. I produced a few Mejidis and Egyptian notes and distributed them. The coins went to Muhammad, Harry, Hassan, and Arami, who were to leave us before we reached the territory where Egyptian notes are current. The rest got the notes, which they would be able to use at El Fasher. To Zerwali, I gave twenty rounds of revolver ammunition and a bottle of scent. Another bottle of scent was divided among the men. Bukhara received one of my pipes and tobacco to go with it, and he declared that he did not know what to do to return all the kindness I had shown him. I have only my camel and the clothes on my back, he said. He has given me the value of my camel in tobacco. It was a cheerful camp at breakfast. The men were pleased with their gifts, and I enjoyed their satisfaction. After breakfast, we all lay down for a siesta, but got up again promptly, our bodies itching furiously from the assaults of white ants. At 5.45 p.m. we made our start, and a half hour later emerged from the valley upon the Serira. In front of us lay a chain of hills running east and west, in the middle of which was Jebel Islinga, and to the right of it, Jebel Aga, to which we were going. Harry said that there was a well also in Jebel Islinga, but that it was difficult to get at. The valley where we had camped was marked by trees on the east side of the entrance to it. It was a hot day, and we moved slowly for six hours when we reached a belt of sand dunes which stopped our progress for the night. Saturday, May 19th. We started at 5.15 a.m. and made our final halt at 8 p.m. There was a hot northeast wind from the hills, which dropped in the evening. We traveled over soft sand, very undulating, covered with dry grass. As we approached the hills, the country became flatter with patches of small black stone. The sun got hot quickly in the morning, and a hot wind was blowing, and so we camped at half-past nine in the shade of a tum-tum tree. Its protection was welcome, and its bunches of red berries made an attractive pattern over our heads. We started again at 3.30 in spite of the heat, with the hope of reaching the hills of Aga before dark. The camels had to be beaten in order to get them away from the shade of the tree and into the hot sun. By 7.30 we were at the foot of the hills, with a slim moon just coming up. Mohammed suddenly raised the alarm. He had found the fresh tracks of two men leading toward Muridi. A stranger in the desert is an occasion for vigilance until he proves to be not unfriendly. Rifles were quickly unslung. The oil rags were stripped from their breeches and cartridges shoved in. The men collected the camels, which were scattered out grazing, 
and Mohammed, Harry, and Sanusi Buhasan went forward to the valley to reconnoiter. After a careful search, they came back to report that there were no tracks leading into the valley, but that there were fresh tracks leading out of it. We made camp at the entrance, keeping clear of trees and vegetation in case anyone approached in the night. We ate dinner rapidly and extinguished our campfire. The camels and gerbas were put in the center of the camp, and the luggage arranged around its edge. Four sentries were posted for the night, and we went to bed. But sleep was difficult because of the oppressive heat and the suspense. Early on the Sunday morning, we got up and approached the valley cautiously. We came across fresh tracks of sheep and men and were convinced that someone had a camp in the valley. Mohammed and Harry went ahead as the inhabitants of this district were Goran and no one else spoke their language. They soon returned with three Gorans. I met them, and we solemnly went through the ceremony of giving and receiving the Aman. We advanced toward each other, and lay whatever weapons we might be carrying, sword or rifle, on the ground. I addressed them in the time-honored phrases. I swear by God that we are peaceful men, that we wish you no harm, and that we have no intention of robbing you. One of them did the same in his turn, and we indulged in brief questions and answers on each side. Who are you? Whence do you come? Whither are you going? On what business? Then we shook hands formally, each took up his weapon, and both sides retired. We tried to buy sheep from them, but they refused to sell. In a short time they went away and returned with three sheep, which they offered as diafa, refusing to accept any money for them. I gave them et kias of blue cloth as a return courtesy, with which they were delighted. The camels were sent off to the well to drink and bring back water for the camp, while the men busied themselves with the preparations for a great feast of meat. In the afternoon I took photographs, and in the evening made observations. The electric torch which I used in reading the theodolite first frightened the Goran boys, and then delighted them. The Valley of Aga is very picturesque a long, narrow defile between high cliffs with more vegetation and trees than we had seen thus far. Halfway down its length it divides, one branch leading southwestward to the well and the other southward toward the open desert. The well is similar to that at Erdi, but its water is badly fouled by sheep and camels. The valley is full of birds whose pleasant songs make one think one is at the aviary in the zoo. We were up while it was dark, and the stars were still shining in the clear sky. The Goran came to say goodbye. Arami and Hassan had declined to go further south and left us to return to Oanat with Arami's camel. We found our way down the eastern fork of the valley, its steep sides protecting us from the sun. On the way we sighted three gazelles, and some of the men gave chase, but the nimble animals climbed the hills and escaped. Hamid, the Zawea, fired at one and missed, to the scornful delight of the others. Hamid, however, refused to admit complete failure. By God, he stoutly maintained, I hit it. I saw the blood spurt. It did not matter so much, however, as we still had meat left from the diapha of the Goran. It quickly got too hot for comfort, and the camels, fresh from drinking, refused to go on. We camped in the shade of a tree, but soon discovered that better protection from the sun was to be had in crevices in the rocks. The camels were allowed to graze, and the men settled down to prepare the midday meal. Two sheep were slaughtered, and their flesh, impaled on sticks, was slowly revolved before the fire to roast in the Bedouin fashion. It was delicious. While the meat was being prepared, Sod cut his hand. I saw the blood and asked where it came from. From Hamid's gazelle, said Bukhara, and once more the shouts of laughter went up over the unsuccessful hunter. After lunch, I wound my watches, recorded the readings of the aneroid and the maximum and minimum thermometers, and wrote up my diaries, when Hamid the camelman came running to say that a herd of ostriches was nearby. We all grasped our rifles and stood ready, Soon the ostriches appeared, thirty or forty in number. 
The Bedouins were impatient and opened fire while the distance was too great. The ostriches dashed off into another valley with the men in hot pursuit. Many shots were fired, but Sir Wally soon came back to say that nothing had been killed. In a little while, Hamid appeared carrying a small ostrich and followed by Sanusi Buhassan. Both men claimed to have shot the creature, and since there were two bullet wounds in it, either of which might have been fatal, they appealed to me for judgment. I asked the opinion of the men who saw the shooting, and all agreed that Hamid's shot felled the bird. I decided in his favor. Later, Hamid, the camelman, small and sharp of features and afraid of no animals, not even snakes, came upon an ostrich in a closed part of the valley, and after attacking it unsuccessfully with stones, rushed at it and caught it around the neck. He wrestled with it manfully, but it landed a kick on his side from one of its powerful legs and ran away. I was watching the contest through my binoculars and nearly split my sides with laughter. The ostrich mounted a ridge, looked back scornfully at Hamid, who stood cursing it, arranged its feathers and trotted off with the gait of a gay dowager, leaving him with his hand pressed to his maltreated side. "'Has the ostrich hurt you?' I asked solicitously when he returned. "'Oh, no,' he replied, quickly taking his hand from his side. "'Why didn't you bring it back, then?' I asked again. "'I had to let it go,' he explained with great plausibility. "'She was only a female.' One of my great regrets on this trek was that I was unable to follow game as I would have liked to. The night marches between Uanat and Erdi left me too exhausted in the morning to do anything but record the readings of my scientific instruments and try to snatch two or three hours sleep before it was too hot. Then our food supply began to get less and less. I could not stay at Aga where there were plenty of gazelles, ostriches, and wild sheep. Besides, the scarcity of water made me lose no time there, where the well had been so fouled by animals. An old Egyptian army martini and an Italian cavalry carbine, which I was given at Kufra, handy as they would have been for self-defense, were of little use for long-range work on game, especially gazelle. Hunting, therefore, was a diversion which I had to deny myself. It was very hot, and we could not start until 5 p.m. We followed the lovely valley for an hour, and then began to climb the hills. As we got to the top, we had a fine view of its beauties, all the various shades of green of the trees and shrubs, making picturesque patterns with the rosy sand and the redder rocks of the hills guarding the valley. The soft notes of innumerable doves floated up on the cool evening breeze. A gorgeous red and gold sunset completed an ensemble not easy to forget. I stopped my horse and spent a pleasant half hour lying on a patch of soft sand, drinking in the delights of this little bit of paradise. It soon grew dark. The crescent moon showed herself, and far away I heard the Bedouins of my caravan singing. Reluctantly I rose and took the track again. We were soon in different country, broken and very undulating, with distant jagged hills surrounding us. The camels were suffering from the foul water of Aga, and so were the men. We camped early, both on this account and because it is dangerous country to travel by the weak moonlight. We dropped into a soft sand valley about 200 meters from our route and camped. We got up with the stars still in the sky on Tuesday, May 23rd, and made our start with a gorgeous sunrise on our left hand. We moved slowly because of the thick shrubs and scattered stones, and also because Mohammed and Harry had not been in this country for ten years and were picking their way cautiously. Mohammed is riding, I suppose, I said to Hamid, the camelman, as I walked in my favorite place behind the caravan, or we would not be moving so slowly. The gray-haired man is walking, Obey, said the shrewd fellow quickly. His track is on the ground. Once more I was impressed with the keen observation of the Bedouins, especially the camelmen. 
Hamid had already learned the characteristic footprints that each man of the caravan leaves. Of course he knew the track of each camel, also. On Wednesday, we were up much earlier than usual in our anxiety to reach the well of Enaba. The water of Aga was the worst we had yet tasted, and it was having its effect on both men and camels. A three-hour trek brought us to the edge of the valley in which the well lay. We dropped down into it, and discovered from tracks of sheep, donkeys, and men that the place was inhabited. Mohammed went forward to meet the men who lived there, and gave and received the Amman. And soon we were camped by the well. The water was excellent. Animals and men both enjoyed the change. There was quite a large Bidiat camp here, with hundreds of sheep and a few horses for the sheiks. Presently the whole population, led by the sheiks, came to greet us. I shook hands with them and distributed scent, putting a little on the hand of each one. In the afternoon they brought sheep as diafa, and the women, who have a keen business sense, produced sam, butter, and leather to sell to us. We gave them medjides and cloth in exchange. In the evening I took observations. The Bidiats were frightened at the theodolite and the electric torch, and their suspicions were aroused. One of the sheiks entered my tent and caught me opening the instrument case. I shut the case quickly and instantly realized my mistake. I could see in his dark, cruel face, with yellow eyes like those of a fox set close together, that he believed I had gold in the box. As he left my tent, I ostentatiously ordered Sanusi Buhassan and Hamid to stand as sentries in the camp. I pointed to them and told the sheik not to allow the women and children to approach the camp at night, lest my men might mistake and shoot at them. It was just a hint that we were wide awake and that there was no hope of catching us off our guard. I could see that the hint went home. End of section 18「Chapter 20 – To Furawiya on Short Rations – the valley of Enaba was covered with soft sand, dotted with the shrubs both green and dry, and with trees. I had a good night's rest and was awakened by the hubbub of the Bidiat woman bargaining with the men of my caravan for empty tins. They offered a kind of dry shrub that they called tobacco and milk in return. Five more sheep were brought as diapha, and more presents were distributed. Encouraged by a cool southeast wind, we started at 3.15 p.m., but the wind soon dropped, and we made slow progress in the heat. The evening was cooler, however, and we made up a little for lost time. The night was cold. On Friday, May 25th, we were up at four and started an hour and a quarter later. The country was very undulating and broken, and Harry was not sure of the way. We moved slowly because of the difficulty of the going and the uncertainty of the guide. Shortly after nine, we dropped into a valley and camped an hour later. Sanusi Buhassan, who was walking beside me, gave expression to his opinion of the guide and his Bedouin pride. Those Goran wobble about like camels, he said. They do not walk like Bedouins who fly straight to their goal like birds. When we took the road again in the afternoon, the sun was still very hot. The camels moved slowly, and the men's singing sounded like broken bagpipes. It was, perhaps, as well that we were compelled to move slowly, for Harry was more uncertain of the way than ever. Some of the time we followed the track left by a flock of sheep going, presumably, toward Bow, but at intervals it was lost in the tracks of broken stones. A little after five, we dropped into a big valley whose name we discovered later to be Konamina, running east and west and filled with fine trees. Just before reaching it, we met a Goran with a few sheep. He came up to me, dropped his sword and spears on the ground, and took off his sandals. We shook hands with many ejaculations of Kif Halak, Tayabin, how are you, very well. It was all the Arabic he knew. Mohammed and Harry then talked with him and learned that there was a Goran camp in the valley before us. 
A cattle merchant had also just arrived from Fada and Wadai with sheep and cows on his way to El Fasher. Mohammed and Harry left us and approached the few straw-thatched huts that constituted the Goran camp. We went across the valley and camped on its farther rim. Soon a man came running to ask us to return to the camp and start again the next day. I appreciated the hospitable suggestion, but felt that we could not afford to retrace our steps, even for two or three kilometers. I thanked him for the invitation and told him that we were in a great hurry. We should camp nearby to wait for our two guides. An hour later, Mohammed appeared, full of news from Fada and Al Fasher, obtained from the merchant. We were busy that evening overhauling our baggage and repairing damages. All the ropes were getting worn, and the Bedouin woolen bags, too. We had been losing much time on the way with reloading and shifting things about. But it was a consolation to know that in a fortnight we should be in El Fasher. We had the most beautiful sunrise on May 26th that I have seen. The brilliant white light on the red and black stones nearby and the distant hills made everything wonderfully clear and distinct. Soon it changed to a warm red glow, and then the golden rays of the sun broke through the thin clouds and flooded everything. The long shadows cast by the rocks and shrubs on the ground looked like black stenciling on the yellow sand. The shadows of the slowly moving caravan made a fantastic pattern. It soon proved to be an oppressively close morning. Harry joined us later in the afternoon with the slaughtered sheep slung on each side of his camel, the diapha from the Goran camp. We followed sheep and camel tracks and marched from one valley into another until we camped in one of the largest of them, which had many shady trees. It is always a problem whether to stop under the shade of a tree and suffer the attacks of white ants and all sorts of sinister-looking insects, or pitch tent in the broiling sun. In the future I shall be inclined to take my chance in the open, as the insects are always with you, while the sun's heat is over by five or six in the afternoon. The valley in which we camped is called Capturku. We started again at four with a southeast breeze that made walking not so tedious. There were also a few clouds which tempered the heat of the sun. The camels walked better. In the late afternoon we passed a Goran family, a man, wife, a naked child, and later we found a well. It was seven meters deep and had good water, though the roots of a nearby tree had rotted in it, giving it an unpleasant odor. We camped at eight, fortunately in a clear space, free from shrubs and stones. At one in the morning, a hyena visited the camp, and had it not been for the vigilance of Hamid, the camelman, it might have got Baraka, who was tied at night and therefore unable to defend himself. Hamid fired at it impulsively, and with my glasses I saw a dark object running far away in the brilliant moonlight. Sunday, May 27th. Start at 5.15 a.m., halt at 9.15 a.m. Start again at 3.45 p.m., halt at 7.45 p.m. Make 30 kilometers. Highest temperature, 38 degrees, lowest, 7 degrees. Fine, clear, and calm in the morning. At midday, strong, hot southeast wind, which drops in the afternoon. Few white clouds, warm and calm in the evening. Very cloudy, with a few drops of rain at 10 p.m. Valleys of soft sand as before, with low sandstone hills 20 to 80 meters high. Patches of the same stone crop out through the sand. Harry proved himself a bad guide. He predicted that we would reach Bow this morning, but when night came, we were not yet there. He knew the places when he saw them, but his sense of direction was faulty. Our water had given out, except for one last gerba, and it was very hot. We marched until 7.45, when we reached rocky ground, dangerous for the camels, even in the clear moonlight. We were on the edge of a large valley, which Harry declared to be that of Bow, but we could not believe him. Experience had taught me not to permit the last of the water supply to be used until we had not only seen the well, but approached it to make sure that there was drinkable water there. I insisted that the last gerba should not be touched that night. 
We went to bed without dinner, since we could not cook without water. There was, however, the consolation of a beautiful night. I lay in bed watching the play of the moonlight on the clouds. A few drops of rain announced the approach of the rainy season. We were astir early. Empty stomachs do not encourage long sleep. We drove the camels as we had not driven them before. How tired they looked and how weak. When camels and men are hungry and thirsty, all the other defects in the caravan come out. There was no singing that morning, merely silent, relentless urging forward of the camels and ourselves. The descent into the valley was steep and dangerous. Three camels threw off their loads, which had to be carried by the men down to the level ground and loaded again. At last we saw a few sheep and a straw hut or two. We stopped, and I let the men drink the water from the last gerba, for which they had asked many times that morning. Harry and Mohammed went ahead and made their way to the huts. The caravan, meanwhile, moved directly down the valley toward the well. Soon some blacks of the Goran and Bidiat tribes came to meet us. We fired our rifles as usual, as if in salutation, but in reality to impress the natives with our preparedness. I noticed that by a curious coincidence, those who met us, men and women, were all old. There was not a single young person among them, especially no young woman. However, it did not strike me as extraordinary, but a little later I was surprised to see batches of slim and beautiful girls, brown or black, half naked in their tattered clothes, holding themselves gracefully erect. As they came along in groups of three or four, I turned to Bukhara and asked, From where are these girls? Bukhara looked at them with great admiration and replied, Allah be great, these are the girls of the village. They thought we were going to rob the village and take away the young girls as slaves, so they sent them out to hide as soon as they sighted our caravan. Now that the men know that we are a peaceful caravan, they have sent word to the girls to come back. As the girls passed my horse, they shyly dropped on their knees in a salutation, as is the custom there when addressing a person of higher rank. In this part of the world, when one is addressed by some more exalted person, the etiquette is not to stand up, but to sit down in token of reverence. One after another, these girls dropped to their knees, and in return I gave them the usual air of blessing. May God's peace be upon you, and his mercy and blessings. As they rose again, the girls bashfully turned to look at my company of admiring Bedouins. We camped at the end of the valley near the well. An hour later, the sheik of the camp came to greet us. We discussed the roads to El Fasher and the direction to be followed. Here, Harry looked thoughtful and sad. This was close to his own country, for we were across the frontier of French Wadai now. He had thrown away his rights and run away from the French, leaving all his property and relatives, and gone to the solitary oasis of Uanat to live in self-inflicted exile. We were getting into a different kind of country. There were many more varieties of birds, including crows, owls, parrots, doves, and others whose names I do not know. In the night, a lioness had killed two donkeys, and some of the natives captured one of its young and sent its skin to Fata to be sold. There are several score of blacks of the Goran and Bidiat tribes at Bao. The women are graceful creatures, clothed with the utmost simplicity. Their dress is either a length of cloth wound skillfully around the body, with a narrow strip of cloth for a belt, in which is carried a small knife or a sheepskin wrapped around the lower part of the body. Their hair is arranged in small plates. They wear ornaments of silver and ivory, heavy rings in their hair, and bead and amber necklaces. Young girls wear only an apron of cloth or leather. The men have splendid physique, go naked except for a loincloth, and carry two or three spears, a sword, and a throwing knife. Only sheiks wear white robes and large turbans. We gave the women and children macaroni, but they refused to eat it. Instead, they threaded the pieces on strings and made necklaces, which they wore proudly. The business instinct of the Bedouins at once displayed itself. 
they made necklaces from our little store of macaroni and exchanged them for butter and leather harry and mohammed were to leave us here they did not care to venture further south i had some difficulty in finding a guide to take us to furawea but at last succeeded a sheep was brought to us as diafa and we dined early on tuesday intending to make a prompt start in the morning the guide did not present himself and i began to feel that the bidiat were suspicious of my caravan at eleven p m he appeared however and i immediately woke the men and set them to loading the camels before he had any chance of changing his mind wednesday may thirtieth start at one a m halt at eight thirty a m start again at four fifteen p m halt at seven fifteen p m make forty kilometers highest temperature thirty six degrees fine and clear strong and dusty southeast wind the wind changes to northeast in the afternoon and drops in the evening country same as before except flatter and with no large valleys and no big trees at eight fifteen a m across a small wadi running east and west when we started at one o'clock there was a beautiful moon which made it as clear as in daylight harry and mohammed started with us as they wished to give the impression to the men about that they were going with us to el fasher otherwise they feared that they might be waylaid in an hour we had climbed out of the valley we halted to say good-bye to the two guides who were going to travel only by night on their way back to uanat to avoid detection as i stood a little apart from the caravan in the moment of farewell to them i realized that the difficulties through which we had come had drawn us close together mohammed was tall erect with a piercing eye and an interesting illustration of the self-assurance that life in the desert gives and the fatalistic resignation with which one accepts whatever comes harry was a gentle-mannered unassuming old man with a benign smile and charming manners there was unquestioned dignity in his movements in spite of an injured left foot which he had to drag when he walked he was a prince by nature this was not merely a parting of companions of the trek but a symbol of the old having run the race pointing the onward road to the young we all forgot that i was head of the caravan and they my guides harry put his hands on my shoulders and spoke with feeling in his voice may god bless you and give you strength he said there is your road he pointed to an opening in the distant hills i murmured a few words in a voice i could scarcely trust not to tremble and turned away to my caravan the two dignified but somehow pathetic figures both exiles from their own land faded away in the moonlight we halted at dawn for our morning prayers and at eight thirty to camp for the day there were tracks of lions about we started again early in the afternoon but the men were tired having had little sleep the previous night and we marched only three hours the sheep which had been given us escaped and in the moonlight hamid and saad went after it bleeding like sheep themselves to attract it but with no success thursday may thirty first start at three forty five a m halt at eight forty five a m start again at three thirty p m halt at seven thirty p m make thirty six kilometers highest temperature thirty seven degrees lowest five degrees fine clear and calm southeast wind in the afternoon which changed to northeast and dropped toward evening calm evening and night with full moon and a few white clouds an uneventful day shortly after an early start on friday june first the guide got sleepy and lost his head we were soon traveling due west instead of southeast i did not interfere until we stopped for morning prayers at five but then i asked him quietly if he had intended to march to the westward he was surprised but admitted frankly his error fortunately we had not been going wrong for long at six thirty we passed a hill called tamira on which stood a dry tree marking the boundary between wadai and the sudan from the boundary post we dropped into wadai hawar a large valley full of big trees which is said to extend westward to wadai and eastward toward the sudan 
In Wadai, it is called Wadi Hawash. The soil in the Wadi is very fertile, and the men from Wadai and Darfur come to it in the autumn for grazing. We camped here for the midday halt and found tracks of giraffe. In the afternoon, we walked through high, dry grass as though through a great field of ripe corn. The men of the caravan were getting worn out, all the more as clothing was tattered, shoes at the last gasp, and to add to our inflictions, we had much trouble with Hashkanit, a small, very hard hook thorn which grows on a low bush and attaches itself to whosoever brushes against it, when it is extremely difficult to extract. I heard Bukhara describing to Hamid a giraffe and an elephant. The giraffe, he said, has the head of a camel, the hoofs of a cow, and the hind quarters of a horse. His word picture of the elephant was grotesque and much exaggerated to impress the man from the north. We made a very early start on Saturday, June 2nd, to make sure of reaching Furawiya that day. At 5 a.m., we passed, on our right, the landmark of Hagar Kamra Ra, ten kilometers away, and an hour later passed another, Hagar Urdu, a hill about 80 meters high and 200 meters long. Hagar is the Sudanese word for gara, or small hill. Then we started dropping into the valley of Furawiya. It was the largest valley and the most inhabited that we had come across. Its people are Zaghawa and a few Bidiat. We camped at nine near Bidiat camp and soon heard the distressing news that no food was to be obtained at Furawiya. This was contrary to my expectation. I made haste to find a messenger to take a letter to the governor of Darfur at El Fasher, asking him to send me provisions and cloth to clothe my men, who were in rags. After much hesitation, caused apparently by fear of my men, the Zaghawa sheik of a camp nearby came, driven by curiosity, to visit us. He was under the Sudanese government, and I pounced on him and offered him three pounds to take a letter from me to Savil Pasha, governor of Darfur. It was liberal pay, and in addition I threatened him with much unpleasantness should he hesitate or refuse. I told him he must start at dawn the next day. After murmuring something about having no animal to carry him, he went away and soon returned to say that he would take my letter to El Fasher. He intended to go on horseback. This was good news, for we had had no sugar for three weeks and had been obliged to sweeten our tea as best we could with pounded up dates. Flour and rice had also given out, and a scanty diet of macaroni prepared with bad water is very monotonous. I moved the camp near to one of the wells in the valley and tried to buy a sheep to cheer up my men. But it was getting dark, and none of the inhabitants came near our camp. We watered the camels and settled down for the night, not very well satisfied with life. I was suddenly surprised to hear my men singing, and apparently as cheerful as though they had had a good meal. I called Zerwali and Bukhara over and asked them what was the singing about when there was no sugar, and little food, and things were generally disagreeable. We can breathe now, answered Zerwali. We have entered the Sudan and feel ourselves at last in safety. Were you so fearful then of this journey we have made, I asked? At Kufra, all our relations said we were walking to our fate when we took this road, explained Bukhara. Your fates are written, they said to us, but may God protect you. We wondered if perhaps they might not be right. You heard at Kufra, said Zerwali, how some people offered you encouragement to take this route, while many advised against it. Those who favored it were malicious men who simply hoped that they would never see you again. It was then also that Zerwali, who, now that we were nearing the end of the trip, felt himself more free to talk, told me that the houses of Sadaida and Jehalat of the Zawaya tribe at Hawari and Kufra had strongly resented my second visit and held a meeting to discuss the best means of either destroying the caravan or preventing me from coming back. Then I realized what pluck it had taken for these men to come with me by the strange and unknown way without a murmur of protest. I was proud of them. At 2 a.m., Hamid, who was acting as a sentry, 
woke me to say that the messenger had arrived and was ready to take my letter to El Fasher. Two letters were all written and ready under my pillow, one to Seville Pasha and the other to the officer in command at Kutum, the outpost on the way to El Fasher, asking him to make sure that my letter to El Fasher reached its destination. I was glad the messenger had come so early. The sooner we got new supplies, the happier we should all be. I promised him a few extra dollars if he would deliver the letter to El Fasher in four days. I bade him a very warm Godspeed and watched him ride off in the moonlight on quite a strong, if ragged-looking horse. End of section 19「Journey's End」Sleep came slowly to me that first night in Furawea. I was excited, as I had not been since saying goodbye to Lieutenant Bather at Solemn and beginning the journey. Now I was in touch again with the outside world, and the journey was really over, even though it would still be a month or more before I could exchange my caravan for other methods of travel. The lost oases of Arkanu and Uanat were no longer lost, and if my observations proved to be as accurate as I hoped they were, a good map could now be made of this strip of the Libyan desert from Jalo to Furawea. We spent three full days at Furawea getting used to the damp climate we had come into and trying to get enough to eat to keep us from feeling miserable. Dark clouds hovered over our heads much of the time, and every day it rained. My men gorged themselves with mutton, but the lack of sugar for the tea and other provisions rather took the edge off their enjoyment of these feasts. On June 6th, we started south in the afternoon and climbed slowly out of the valley. We passed many flocks of sheep and cattle going home, followed by slim girls and boys clad in nothing but a loincloth or strings of beads. It was quite different from the desert we had come through. We were following a beaten track and passing frequently small villages of straw huts, women carrying hatab, and other signs of habitation. Near one of the villages, I told the caravan to go ahead and pointed out to them where we would camp. I followed with my horse. There were a few points of interest geographically, and I had to take some observations. As I was nearing the camp, I heard the voices curiously upraised, a mixture between men wailing and singing. My first thought was that some of the men of the caravan had got into trouble with the natives. I spurred on my horse, and as I was approaching the camp, my mind was relieved, for I heard the tom-tom of the drum and women's voices singing. It was just after sunset, and in the dusk I could not distinguish clearly the crowd that was moving toward me, but soon one of my men came rushing up to tell me that they had had the most cordial reception from the men and women of the village who insisted on coming out to receive the sheik of the caravan. He had hardly broken this news to me when a bevy of young girls, some singing, others dancing, surrounded my horse, who responded as befitted a Bedouin horse and started prancing. The women raised lulias, and I was urged by my Bedouins to empty gunpowder. The crowd made way for my horse, and I walked him off a short distance, turned around, came rushing back, and pulled him up dead. By that time, I had got out my rifle, and as my horse stopped dead, I fired my shot in Bedouin fashion at the feet of the first row of beautiful damsels. They were half frightened and half delighted. Then six of them surrounded the horse, circling round me, and gave me the shabal. That is to say, with a sudden twist of the head, they whirled their tresses toward me, as a woman of southern Europe might throw a rose. In response, I put my finger on each girl's forehead, and holding my rifle high in the air, twirled it around her head, crying, Abshir Bilkir, rejoice in the bounty of God. We then formed ourselves into a procession and proceeded to the camp. The moment they saw me coming, surrounded by all those girls, the Bedouins fired in the air in honor of the occasion. The Bedouin is very chivalrous, and such is his idea of honoring the ladies. Afterward, I distributed scent to all the girls, who went away very happy, and it was a most cheerful evening in the camp. 
The next day we reached Umburu, 38 kilometers from Furawea. We camped near the well, and the next morning I was awakened early by sounds of cattle and sheep coming to water. An hour later, a busy market was being held alongside our camp. We had unwittingly pitched our tents close by the big tree that marked the center of the marketplace. Only women took part in the market, bringing butter, leather, mats, maize, cotton, and salt, which they bartered with each other without the use of money. Meanwhile, the men lay about at their ease and did nothing. As I watched such a scene as this, and others not unlike, in the villages of the Sudan, I found myself wondering whether the black women were not, after all, better off as slaves in a Bedouin household. Here they do all the work that is done, caring for cattle and sheep, doing the housework, and preparing meals and making the favorite beverage Marissa for their men, carrying on the business of the market, everything. As slaves, they would have only certain circumscribed duties and some opportunity for leisure. As I turned this over in my mind, however, I seemed to catch something in the sound of their talk and their laughter that slaves do not have. Perhaps there is something in the feeling of liberty, after all, even when it is accompanied by drudgery. We stopped at Umburu for two days. Abdel Rahman Jeddu, Wakil of Mohammedin, the head of the Saghawa tribe, visited me and brought sheep and chicken as diafa. On the second day, we were given an official welcome, the wakil coming with a retinue of retainers on horseback, beating drums. Mohammedin's family, in the absence of the master of the household, sent a lunch of aceta, vegetables, marissa, and pastry. The next stage of our journey was a five days trek to Cuttam, 129 kilometers to the southward. The weather was generally good, though hot, with an occasional shower. We traveled as usual in the early morning and late afternoon. There was a beaten track with fairly good going, through hilly country covered with dry grass and small trees. At intervals there were patches which had been burnt in preparation for being cultivated. On the third day, my messenger to El Fasher arrived with two companions, but it was a disappointing meeting. It had taken him five days instead of four to reach his destination, and he had not brought the answer to my letter back with him. It was waiting for me, he said, in the possession of a soldier at Mutareg Well, twelve hours' journey from where we were. The soldier also had provisions for us, but they did us little immediate good at that distance. There was little for dinner when we camped that night. After dinner, I sent our guide off post-haste with orders to ride all night until he reached Mutarig. There, he was to tell the soldier to come to us as fast as he could. We started before four the next morning, and in an hour the men came rushing to me with the news that there was a soldier ahead on a camel. In a few minutes, I had a letter from Charles Dupuy, acting governor of Darfur, in the absence of Savile Pasha, who had resigned from the service, and a small supply of rice, flour, teas, and sugar. I was especially pleased to be handed a supply of cigarettes. I had not smoked since soon after leaving Erdi. At Uanat, I had suddenly realized that there were only a few cigarettes left. I then laid down a strict rule for myself, one cigarette a day after dinner. It was hard work waiting all day for that brief smoke, but it was worth it when the moment came. I would get into a sheltered corner, light the precious cigarette, and shield it carefully from any breath of wind that might make it burn ever so slightly faster. When the few cigarettes were gone, there was nothing left but memories and expectation. Now, at last, the expectation was gratified with a vengeance, for I smoked until my throat was sore. Bukhara, with a handful of the newly arrived cigarettes, put on his long-tasseled red tarbouche, got on the guide's horse, and did a little fantasia of joy. But it was when we camped at the government rest house at Maharig that general rejoicing broke loose with singing and dancing. The corporal, looking on while the men set the sugar loaf on the ground and executed a wild dance about it, thought us all a little mad. 
why all this rejoicing he demanded because for a month we have had no sugar and now our tea is sweetened again said abdullah until one has tried going without any sugar whatever one does not realize how keenly it will be missed the corporal shook his head and smiled i must return at once to cut and bring you more provisions he said we never realized that you were so short of food before he left he was kind enough to go to a camp nearby and bring us a sheep and butter which were to be paid for by the moawin of Kutum, since a seller refused to accept egyptian paper money the corporal then left with letters from me for mr dupuy and the moawin the deputy governor of Kutum. the provisions which he had brought us were good as far as they went but we should very soon be in need of more I decided to push on at once. We made our midday halt at the government rest house at Maharig Well and our stop for the night only a few kilometers farther on. The camels were in very bad condition. The backs and sides of some of them were sore and bleeding, and two camels refused to move until their loads were taken off. It rained for an hour that evening, but it could not dampen our spirits. The men sang and danced around a big fire. The humidity and the smell of the wet grass reminded me of my walks in English country. We made an early start the next morning in order to reach Mutarig well for the midday halt. We lunched at the rest house near the well and received a visit from the sheik of Mutarig, who brought a few chickens as diafa. He wanted us to stop the night so he could entertain us properly the next day, but I felt the necessity of going on as fast as possible. The camels were getting steadily worse. We had to leave one of them with the sheik of the village on the understanding that if it recovered, he was to get a quarter of the price it brought when sold, while if it died, he was not to be held responsible. An hour and a half after starting the next day, another soldier on horseback appeared. He brought a letter from the Moawin of Kutum and a small quantity of rice and sugar. They are gratefully received, for once more we were on short rations and without sugar for our tea. I gave him a letter to take back to Kutum. A little later we camped in the small valley of Boa. In the afternoon, soon after we had started again, it came on to rain with a strong southeast wind, and I thought it might be wise to camp until the storm was over. But through my glasses I made out ahead of us a row of straw huts of the Marcus, the government house of Cutham, and spurred on by the sight, we drove the camels faster. Soon a group of horsemen were seen approaching us, and my Bedouins impulsively raised a cheer. When I recognized the uniform of Sudanese troops, it was the most cheering sight that I had seen for many weeks. Riyad Abu Akla Effendi and Nasser el-Din Shaddad Effendi, the two Moawins of Kutum, approached with a detachment of ten soldiers, the caddy, the head clerk, and other officials and notables of Kutum. I shook hands warmly with them all, and under their escort, the caravan moved on through the village. As we approached, the Marcus women, clothed in white and beating drums, greeted us with singing and lulias. We settled ourselves in and about the rest house, and the women came again to offer greetings. In a long line, they sang and danced, much to the delight of my Bedouins, who asked permission to empty gunpowder in acknowledgment of the courtesy. I could not refuse my consent, and one by one, beginning with Bukhara, the men performed the ceremony of singeing the girls' slippers. The Sudanese women were not so accustomed to the Bedouin manner of paying homage as the girls of the northern desert, and flinched a little as the powder flashed at their feet but they accepted it all in good part, the whole line swaying and dancing to the rhythm of the drums, while one of my men singled him out for the slipper-singing honor. It was a wonderful reception, and the pleasure of it dispersed like magic the fatigue and lassitude of the journey. More hospitality was to come. Four sheep, butter, and fresh vegetables, to say nothing of sugar, were brought to us as diapa from the Moawins and officials, and we spent a pleasant evening feasting. Our arrival at Kurum at this particular moment had seemed to the inhabitants there an especially auspicious one, 
for we came with the first rain of the season. We stopped there for two days, entertained generously by the Moawins in the absence of the inspector, Mr. Arkell, who was at El Fasher. One afternoon we attended a soccer match between two teams of soldiers. It was played with energy, if not finesse. At times a player, striving to give the ball an especially vigorous kick, would miss it and send his Sudanese slipper shooting high into the air. The camaraderie between officers and men, playing this not exactly gentle game together, was interesting to see. Dinner that night with Riyadh Effendi and Nasser al-Din Effendi, the Mullawins, was the first meal I had eaten in a house since leaving Kufra. My host gave me Egyptian newspapers to read, the first I had seen in nearly six months. We left Kurum at six o'clock in the morning of June 17th, cheered by the generous hospitality we had enjoyed and the friendly send-off our friends gave us. The two days' journey to El Fasher was a joyride. We all felt the thrill and exhilaration of getting in touch with the world again. But as I went to bed on the 18th, I realized with a stab of regret that this was my last day in the real desert. I thought how I should miss my men and my camels, the desolateness and the beauty, the solitude and the companionship. In two words, the desert and its life. I thank God for his guidance across this vast expanse of pathless sand and found myself adding a prayer, half wistfully, that I might come back to it again. I had given orders for an early start the next morning. In their eagerness, my men somewhat exaggerated my idea of early, but I was excited myself and did not mind getting under way at half-past two. Three hours' march from El Fasher, we camped to make preparations for entering the place. We all shaved and put on our best clothes. Mr. Dupuy had sent a supply of white cloth to Kutum for us, and my men were able to appear once more in decent raiment. They crowded around my remnant of a mirror to see how they looked. Rifles were cleaned, and the luggage, which was in a very shabby state, was tidied as much as possible. I wished that I might be able to do something for the camels as well, which were thin and dejected looking, but rest and attention to their sore backs were what they needed, and we had no time or facilities for giving them that. Nevertheless, they too seemed to be infected with a spirit of eagerness felt by all of us and walked forward briskly. Abdullahi and Zerwali got into their silks and the caravan moved gaily toward its destination. As we reached the outskirts of El Fasher, cheers of rejoicing arose throughout the caravan. A cavalcade of men in khaki was coming toward us. I put spurs to Baraka and he responded willingly. He saw the horses before us, pricked his ears forward, and dashed toward them. Mr. Dupuy came forward on his horse to meet me, and we shook hands warmly. The greetings were repeated by the English and Egyptian officers of his staff, and we went on to his house, a part of which he generously made over to me and the men of my caravan. The weary camels were promptly taken in hand by Bimbashi Andas, who gave them food, water, and the medical treatment for their wounds they so much needed. The officer in charge of the wireless station kindly got me the exact Greenwich time from Paris by radio. I was pleased to discover that my chronometer had lost only 23 minutes and 23 seconds in eight months. For ten days I was a guest of Mr. Dupuy and was lavishly entertained by the officers and officials of the garrison, both English and my own compatriots, and the notables of the town. Hospitality was showered upon me, and every kind of assistance that could possibly be needed was eagerly rendered. This was civilization again. I enjoyed once more the luxuries of life, especially vegetables and fruits. It is only when one has gone through the austere regime of the desert that one looks upon these things as luxuries and not necessities. There was, in particular, a brand of prunes, the pride of Major Smith and of peculiar lusciousness. He called them, if winter comes, and I have never tasted their like anywhere. 
At last the day came when I must take leave of my companions of the trek from Kufra. When Bukhara and his brother and Hamid and Sunusi Bujaber came to my room to say goodbye, it was a moment full of real emotion and crowded with memories. These rugged men of the desert burst into tears, and I found my own eyes wet. We had been through thick and thin together and came out fast friends. I could never wish for better companions on a journey into desolate regions, more able, more manly, or more loyal. We read the Fatha, the sound of the familiar sacred phrases punctuated by Bukhara's sobbing. I exchanged a final hand clasp with each of them, and we parted to meet one day, I hope, in that desert that I love as much as they. One more camel trek before me eastward to El Obeid. There I took train for Khartoum and thence home to Cairo, where I arrived on August 1st, 1923. I had been away from home seven months and 23 days, having trekked 2,200 miles across the desert by caravan. I had determined, finally, the position of the Zegan Wells and of Kufra on the map of Africa, in the placings of which there had been hitherto errors of 145 kilometers respectively. I had also had the great good fortune to put the lost oases of Arkanu and Uanat definitely on the map of the Libyan desert. To A.M.H. I crave no statue in a public street, nor page of history to give my name. A desert flower on my winding sheet is all I ask to mark the way I came. There were no jewels buried in the sand. The treasure that I sought was little worth. I went, but oh, how few will understand to tread an unworn carpet of the earth. Wide spaces called me, and the way was free. Feet falter not upon a road unknown. How languish one who, looking back, can see a thousand miles, no footsteps but his own. Not a half a hundred voyagings for gold could make me rich, as many times I've been, when, weary-eyed, I've watched the dawn unfold and spread soft radiance o'er a desert scene. Thoughts were my treasure. Where may thoughts be sold? My world was empty, but my world was clean. G. F. Foley El Fasher, June thirtieth, nineteen twenty three. End of section twenty. Read by Stephen Seidel. End of the Lost Oases by Ahmed Mohammed Hassanian.